Gary, it wouldn't be such a big deal if you would get your finger out of there. I mean, it's just, you keep putting your <laughs> finger in it. It's going to keep irritating it. And then that's why your finger smells like poop. I know, but if I take it out, it'll make a loud pop, and I don't want that on the show. Oh, well, well I think uh, we're live. You, you know I, I, I don't judge. It's time for a little Saturday morning fun time! Thanks, Mike. Your show manager is Martin Lacasa Santana and John Aaron Schmidt. And your producer is Martin Lacasa Santana. I'm your announcer, the Comic Relief Crusader. And now, your hosts, Tom and Jerry. I mean, Gary. Tom and Gary, not this film is not rocket science. Just say yes audience. and we'll move on. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> so um i don't know if keith's wanting to do it tom but uh are you aware of the the british uh, uh game show called um would you lie to me can't say that i, I am think it's, no. it isn't it would i, lie I thought to that was like how you started every conversation in bed yeah would i kill that lady no seriously it's would you lie it's, to me it, it's nine inches seriously <laughs> But um, it's a good show, and I, I wanted to start doing it as a segment on our uh, Friday show. It's what and, I lied to you, I think. Yeah, would I lie to you? Mm -hmm. And it's it's just a, such a great little uh, game show. There's no real points. Nobody wins money. It's, it's just fun. three comedians versus three comedians. And they've got to decide who's telling the truth when they tell a story. Because they pick up a card and you have to oh, read something. Okay. And they have to decide if that person's telling the truth or lying. They had an American kind of version of this way back in the day, but it wasn't oh, they did. They they so brought it. As, it didn't uh, last one season because it just doesn't work. Uh, Americans they had the worst comedians on there too. So, but anyway, um, we're going to be talking about. Uh, but no, I'm not really yeah. aware of it. So yeah. Oh, to answer your question. It's it's something that uh, I want to try, and I'm hoping Keith will jump on board with me. It's hard to tell. He's hard to read sometimes. So uh, we've got uh, our another friend of ours is here, just another red shirt, has joined us on the show. And, of course, love of my life, Anima Confused. Oh, I know that guy. Yeah, red shirt. He is uh, the single longest living red shirt in the history of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, because he's still there. <laughs> He's refusing to die. He's lived so long, he thinks God might have forgot about him. And I'm it's hoping. because of him, I actually created a, a little T-shirt I've wanted to sell for a long time. That is a red T-shirt with a black collar. And on it, it would say, I've been on an away mission, and all I got was this red shirt. <laughs> I like that idea. So, um, Sci-Fi Mombi is here. Welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, let's see. Penny is here. Sci-Fi Mombi. Um, Andy and Morrow is here in the chat. And, and that, that is it right sort of now in the chat. We got 22 watching and just a handful. And uh, Tom, a lot of them are watching on Twitter. Yeah, but for some reason, they, they're not interacting with us on Twitter. Are you having that experience? I don't know. I don't stream to Twitter. Oh, you don't? No, I um, We... We get some really good numbers off of Twitter. People just jump on and start watching us. Hmm. Yeah, I don't and, know how it works. So, well, up above you add Twitter to one of your locations. You didn't know that? I figured you would. I am tech tarted as hell. 
Like people, I tell people this all the time and they're always surprised by it. But yeah, like, I don't understand this stuff. I just put videos on and people. Well, you're good at making those videos with Andre. I mean, they're top notch videos. He handles the number crap. So. Yeah, but you're the one who directs those videos, right? Put them together. I've written some and I edit most of them, but yeah, no, like it doesn't mean that like, I don't follow the analytics. I don't know much of the ins and outs. I barely know how to start a stream, but the problem is, is Andre barely knows how to start a stream too. So it, I still look good. So um, you get two <laughs> tech tards. <laughs> basically. Yes. <laughs> show together. <laughs> oh man. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, we're That's doing just between inter- you and I. Yeah, nobody needs to know. Oh shit, people are watching. Fuck. Um, Again, there's he at needs least- to be nice to my team. He might run off to Midnight's Edge and help them do their show. When you're <laughs> seeing on him, he's he's helped us a lot, dude. Um, Gary is a bastard of a boss. I was listening to him before the show. He's just berating Martin, just tearing no, him no. down I no mean, no no gary's not a bastard of a boss gary's he's like I, I could produce a better show out of my wiener like what is wrong with you <laughs> you know what's really funny dude well if we go gaming live okay and we are chatting in the game and he, other people in the game can hear him talking and he keeps calling me boss during the game hey boss <laughs> please stop I find calling me that during the game time when we're gaming that's, that just sounds so fucking weird. So, uh, John Chipotle is here. Hi, Onion. Is it John or should we call you Juan? No, no it uh, has to be an Italian version, not a Spanish Italian version. Is, oh, it's um, Italian. Giovanni. It's Italian. It's, it's yeah, Giovanni. It should be Giovanni. Giovanni, Giovanni Chipotle. Yeah. Testerora Escuch. <laughs> John, he says, John, I don't fine. think that's Italian. John, in I said my apologies. <laughs> you, had to, you, you, had, you had to hear that. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so, again, I want to point out it's really weird with all the versions that have been put out of this film, Enemy Mine. Uh, there is no version that has a making of documentary uh, in the uh, special features. In fact, their bonus features are pretty much crap. Like original. Yeah, I got an import trailer. that's got uh yeah, the trailer and a deleted scene. And that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's really freaking awesome. Well, this movie has never gotten much love. I don't know if it has some rights issues or what's the deal with it. Um, I mean I Fox owns distribution here in the US. I don't know what it's if it's the same outside of so Disney would own it now, so that's probably a reason why it hasn't gotten much love in the last few years. But stateside, I think it's only had a DVD release, and that was 15, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, there's been a couple of Blu-ray releases outside of the U.S., but uh, yeah, it's it's a very difficult film, I guess, to get your hands on in any real great version of it. But uh, uh, to me, it's a, a very overlooked sci-fi film. And it evokes a lot of, uh, and there's these classic episodes. Um, I'm reminded of one specifically, but I know there's more that are basic example of this, like in Planet of the Apes series, where you have one of the main good guys and one of the main bad guys stuck together in a situation and have to work together. This movie took that concept and just expanded it into a film. Um, and it works so well. And uh, sadly, I feel like it's a movie when we do talk about a lot of sci fi films. Uh, and such that gets overlooked and to me personally uh, i think it's uh, one of the better ones that uh, doesn't get talked about enough yeah and the uh, effect like blade runner gets weird. evoked constantly but this never you know what i mean yeah it's it's weird and this film uh has some great tropes in it uh but the effects amazingly uh visual effects were done by the same guys that did uh uh never ending story Mm-hmm. And so, it might have been uh, the same some company. of them oh, yeah. the the matte paintings are done by ILM and and that the, oh. shows ILM did there the matte great paintings. matte paintings in that film. yes there are and and that's the the, the scenery is incredible 
I would argue almost in terms of sci-fi movies, because I remembered this from way back in the day before I rewatched it to do the show here, that I remember the show as being kind of hokey on some of its set dressing and effects, like the pillars that fall over yeah. and, and, and some of that stuff. But what saves this movie... they look what, like rotted old trees. Yeah. What makes the movie is the writing. And I know everybody says that about classic Doctor Who. Um, it's 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 very much in evidence here. The, the, this is 1985, two years after the, the return of the Jedi. And this doesn't look, you know, to me, I mean, at least it doesn't have any Ewoks in it, but it it didn't live up to the, quite the same standard of effects that we'd that we'd gotten used to for six years watching the first three Star Wars movies. But the writing and the dialogue and the makeup in this for Lewis Gossett Jr. is incredible. So it has that. And the other one, I I had a really weird moment when I was rewatching this. Like, where have I heard this music before? And yeah, I thought, it's like Star Mad, Trek. And I saw Mad Max. And I went and looked. Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome had the exact same composer, Maurice Jarre. And it came out the same year, 85 or 80. Yeah, 85. And there's there's some musical phrases when they're, when there's a tender moment or a, 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 a you're supposed to feel hope or you're supposed the audience is supposed to feel this is a this is a, a a seriously emotional moment between these two characters here and and the refugees and at the end of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome where they're finally going to make it away from this hellscape and go start a new life and there's some musical phrases I think he just lifted from one and plugged right into the other because I swear I'm hearing part of the Mad Max soundtrack when I'm listening to this. So yeah, was that it, a, it, he's it, done a, I, I was amazed that I got, cause I looked up Maurice Jarre and I was like, he did that. He did that. He did that. He did that. I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't know how many, movies, I had no idea he had done so many, the scores for so many movies. This is, this no, we is haven't almost, even, okay, almost sorry. John Williams level. Is what I was I say, saying. We haven't even fact, mentioned that Wolfgang Peterson was the director, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wolfgang Peterson, who famously did uh, Das Boot. Yeah. Um, great. And Amadeus, director. right? Amadeus. Um, just fantastic. And I want to point out, too, this. I want to show this. Share screen. Uh, boom, boom. And there we are. So. This is a, a you know, he's a, applying additional makeup to Louis Gossett Jr. here, but that is uh Stephen du Dupuis uh touching up the makeup on Louis Gossett Jr. And, and the makeup on this was incredible because, like, the early design of the mask didn't work. Plus, the original director, do you remember who the original director was? I forget his name because he got fired after a few weeks. And they went and reshot a lot of the film. And in the process of these changes, they also made alterations to the makeup. Richard Lawn Crane. Richard yeah, Lawn Crane. Crane was the original director, and they reshot everything he'd done. Yeah, because he had been shooting for four and a half weeks, I think, five weeks. That's a lot of fucking footage, dude. Yeah. Because most shoots are 10 weeks. So, um, and then they made changes, alterations to the makeup. So he would spend less time in the makeup chair. But in the process, they had those lenses. Now, I remember, and Keith remembered it too, that there was an issue, legal issue later, that he had continued problems with his eyes that were caused from making this film and using those lenses. Because they, they were probably use, glass. That's probably They why. were glass. Yeah. yeah. And... What were you going to say? I was going to say there's other actors who've had similar issues because of that. I mean, when you asked me about this, I had never heard about like, sadly, this is one of those movies that because there is not a lot out there about it, I don't know a shit ton about it. So when you told me about this, this is the first time I heard about it, but I wasn't surprised because yeah, there's been a lot of actors who've dealt with the glass, um, the glass lenses, uh, uh, lenses back in the day. They were designed by makeup on to have issues not. and or scratch their eyeballs while they had them. Yeah. In. yeah. Yes. Because they weren't made by lens professionals. They were made by makeup guys. That's the problem. And, and the other major issue is they would cut oxygen 90s. off as well. That was the other thing they discovered later on. 
And this yes. is why, you know, it's such important deal for contact lenses to have, you know, the breathing aspect to them or whatever. And they make that yes. as part of their, you know, selling part of it. Because, yeah, because if you cut oxygen off to your eyeballs, it can cause major issues up to and including blindness. It's a big yes. deal. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it back, was, back, yeah. When, back when lenses were glass before they developed the plastic contact lenses, you couldn't keep them in for 24 hours. I mean, yes. they, the, 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 op, no. the, the eye doctor would tell you, you have to take them out at night before you go to bed and put them back in in the morning. You cannot wear I'm these 24 I'm trying to remember. Seven. There was a movie that was done a while back where they put them in for, I'm trying to remember what it was, but they literally could only keep them in for like 20 minutes at a time at the most. And they were just excruciating, they said. And I'm trying to remember what movie it was. Yeah. He's wearing yeah. full, and he's wearing larger than normal contact lenses. Yeah, because they went all the way up. And uh, as uh, I will tell you, as a paramedic uh, working in a medical field, uh, I remember a case where a woman just kept putting lenses on her eyes and couldn't figure out where her lenses were going. And they were slipping up. Mm. Oh, my God. Oh, I've read about cases like that. And it got infected. And that's why we were dealing with her, because she had pus coming out of her eye. Um, so they're, they're just scary, man. Lenses. I've refused. I tried them once when I was a kid, uh, and I hated the feeling of putting them in my eye. So I said, no, I'm, and I've worn glasses ever since. Also, I only need glasses for up close, uh, you know, for reading. Uh, I can see long distances just fine. Yes, I have a mild astigmatism, but the fact is, is, um, it, it doesn't phase me. I can drive without glasses just fine. I've never had an accident. Uh, but, man, contact lenses are just so uncomfortable. And Anima wears them. She, she wears them all the time. I've been wearing them for over 25 years. I never had problems. And I had hard ones at first. And the, the eye doctor was amazed that I just put them in my eye without flinching. And, and I went yeah, off to read. No. Because you, don't, you keep them in for 20 minutes and then see how I'm doing. And I got bored. It was a shopping center. So I just walked across to the bookstore and started reading. And at some point he looked out to see if I'm coming back and he saw me with a book and he was like, oh my God. So apparently I'm super easy with lenses. <laughs> so when it comes down to it, there's so many things that we want to know about this film, but there's never been a, a book written about the making of this film and no documentary behind the And scenes. they pulled all the media coverage um, of his problems that he had. It was so hard to come up it's, with two You can't find it. There's found. only two articles we found that even mentioned it. And they mentioned it during production. There's no none of that post stuff because I remember that shit. And what I'm thinking about is actually going back because, you know, our internet back in the day were magazines. And I'm going to go back and look to see what I find on Cinefantastic, uh, Starlog, and shit like that because I have like a lot of copies digitally on my computer. And I'm just going to go back and see if I can find anything. But we did about as much research as we could do before the, this weekend on this thing. And we only found two articles. And it happened during the period that the Internet existed. So they should be out there. But yet I can't find it anywhere. And hey, like you, you a... don't even remember it, Tom. And we have a super chat from yeah, Christian no. DeLorme. Ah, Christian DeLorme with his vinyl revival. Yeah. $2 Canadian. Thank you, sir. He says, I'm smoking supper and saying, hey, do you, aren't you supposed to eat your supper? I think you're doing something wrong. Well, maybe I don't know what gonna... Canadians do. Yeah, Canadians are weird. Maybe you're he's a caveman, Gary. What would you know about cooking food first? <laughs> you eat what, everything Martin? raw. Maybe he's just having a, a nice cigar. Yeah, he's, that, that is supper. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> that and some PBR, Pats Blue Ribbon. Oh, I remember in my dark days. Sometimes and I just have a Coke for lunch. Yay. <laughs> did we get any clips from the film? Did you make any? Were you able to? No, no, I didn't. No, that's all right. We can just start but the film strip. And I can give him this one. Hello. Hey, Brian, it's me. I got a question for you. Herbert and I are playing categories. Would you count NyQuil as a beverage? Um. No, right? No. Yeah, not going to fly, old man. Thanks, Brian. Oh, that is bullshit. <laughs> I haven't played that video in a while. I can move us down here if you guys want to. Where do you guys want to be? Up here? I yeah. like this one. 
I guess this movie. It was a short story. You can buy the book uh, on Amazon. I've got it on my cart because I'm actually wanting to to see the source material. I was just going to say, I guess the original budget was seventeen million, then it ballooned to forty. It looks like here. Um, It's uh, it started uh, under a completely different studio head at Fox, and then Barry Diller came in, and uh, that's probably another reason why it kind of got shuffled off. But the only reason it got finished is because they had big contracts with uh, the stars uh, that were pay or play, I guess. Uh, They wanted Terry Gilliam originally to direct it, I guess, here, according to this. That would have been interesting. Yeah, it'd been interesting indeed. The performance oh. by Lewis Gassett Jr. in this is probably one of the best parts of this film. It is just how different from anything else oh. he's ever done. And mm-hmm. how he found his voice in playing his character. And the language. He had to learn the language. A lot of it was shot in Germany and Iceland. Yep, Germany and Islas, uh, the Canary the, Island, the Canary Islands, and Spain. Spain. Now there yeah, is that's... another actor that had a great career as a kid, not as an adult, as Lance Kerwin. We lost him a few years ago. He died young. Uh, well, I I can tell you, I think there's been no documentaries or anything about this. This yeah, man. Movie, this movie lost a ton of money. Oh yeah, it only made like what twelve million. Tw- okay, because yeah. there's something else that's here that's kind of left out. I'm trying to figure this out. It looks like this must have started under a different director. It they did. won't. It they won't say here who it is. But well, uh, Red Shirt th- mentioned it earlier. Who uh, was, it? was his name? It's uh, it is. I'll find it. It's in the uh, extras in IMDb. Oh, uh, that's what I was looking Richard, for here. Richard Long Crane. Yeah, long okay. train. Okay, he yeah, because was... Wolfgang turned it down, but then he finally agreed once they allowed him to come in and completely reshoot it. Yes. So they had already started. That's probably why this movie cost forty million dollars. It was basically yes. shot twice. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, and it didn't make. Yeah. Oh, here it we go. Four, make, after four weeks. Make, okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it even made half of its production budget. Never mind marketing. Once again, I want to oh. point out your average shoot uh, for a film is ten weeks, and he got uh, it was a little over four weeks shot and that's a lot of footage that's about half the movie roughly yeah yeah Yeah, i just i just put in the private chat i just put a link to a la times article the title is one studio has seen the enemy and it is costly (laughs) and it's all about the numbers now lance Kerwin is best known to fans for the miniseries salem's lot which he was great in that that mini series slash movie. I've only ever seen the movie with uh, David Soul. I'll have to look for that. Yeah, what they did is it was a mini series, and then they compressed it into a film. It's not as long as the mini series. I'd rather watch the mini series. I gotta imagine that the reason why we saw this endlessly on HBO and other cable channels growing up is because yeah they were just trying to make their money back on it they were trying to make their money back and they eventually did uh uh, make their money back but it it was not a profit profitable film and i think that's another reason why we don't see any behind the scenes but there's got to be somewhere behind the scenes video footage well it sounds like the, the production was so tumultuous i can understand why um and, and the movie was shut down once, restarted, plus, you know, so like, yeah, it was, I did not realize how much of a tumultuous production it was. But the fact that it was shot in Germany, that's where I was wondering if it wasn't under the, under the same company that did do a never ending story. And maybe that's part of the rights deal too. Cause I know there's some, all the Warner has the the u.s rights there's some wacky rights that have to do with that all over the place didn't you say when we watched it gary that there's a connection to the never-ending story 
yeah, the effects guys, uh, some yeah. of the visual effects were done See, by and, uh, same people. And, and that's the same thing too with uh, uh, Never Ending Stories. That was shot in Germany, and I think it might have been that same company. It's like SLM or something like that. It's a production company, I think, that made it. The, the pond where Davich and Shegan meet for the first time is the same artificial pond custom built for the model submarine scenes in Das Boot, also directed by Peterson, as well as one or two scenes from the never ending story. So they, they all, yeah. all three of those movies share that, that okay. connection. Yeah. yeah. And I will say, you know, this film has a great flow to it. Uh, and it's, it, it clearly it's a pretty tight movie for the most part. I mean, there is a little lag in like the middle of the second act, but it, it is pretty well paced. Yeah. And it, the only time I felt that it, it loses that pace is it does these jumps near the end where you, or just, yeah, maybe it's more in the third act. You're probably right. Yeah, but we're probably thinking about the same stuff jumps. though. They just suddenly, you know, uh, throw you, he's found on this planet. No explanation, yeah. really. I mean, they say something in there, but it's like, wait a minute, what? And then he's suddenly back with his starship, and he's got to come back to this planet because he knows Samis, his uh, yeah. godchild, is is being held by these scavengers. One of them led by the very fucking dangerous uh, late Brian James. Well, and uh, he was a dangerous dude. You're right, because the funny thing now that I think of, because I, I haven't watched this. I watched this last like last month, actually, ironically. That's why I didn't watch it again. Um, But it was like, yeah, now you say that I remember the ending almost feels like they were planning like some kind of trilogy. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, nope, we're not going to make a trilogy. Just just wrap it up. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Wrap it up. I'll take it. Wrap it, it up. You know? We're done. <laughs> we're done. Sort of like the way Stephen King writes a book. It's like, oh, shit, I'm at page 1200 i better wrap this shit up real quickly because he has yeah. the worst endings of any yeah because well seen. he writes four endings and then decides which one he wants to use which one the other one stay he throws darts at the, at the end. yeah He's, that's the one he has so elephant he, I, i've he always saves said the, he saves his wife by riding down the hill on a bicycle while she's in a because clearly there state. there could be much more story to be told here, right? Like you have this bridge now between these two warring civilizations and how that could yeah. be, you know, the yep. setup for and future it, films. It just, but yeah, they just truncated the ending. And yeah, it, the only part of the film that bugs me is the ending. But the rest of it is so good. The alien creature, you know, that lives in the pit. Fuck, man. Even Anima about lost her shit when it dug up through their uh, uh, hut. Yeah, and it attacks them. It's like, whoa, that's an intense scene. Well, we should probably explain the story a little bit because I'm sure there's a large part of our audience who may have never even seen this movie because as we yeah, pointed out, it is kind of a premise. You're difficult right. You're film right. to find. And what it is is it's set in the future and and the, the, the Earth is warring against this reptilian-like race and they're basically fighting over... Uh, Colonization. Col well, basically, yeah, because we encroach supposedly into their domain um and we didn't know it and it just set off this whole war kind of is basically what we understand you know and and so these two are two fighter pilots that are in a battle and they end up stranded on this desert planet and they have no way of communicating with the outside world and and the planet is extremely um what's the word i'm looking for uh hostile it's a very yeah, hostile, hostile environment yeah yeah thank you yep it, it basically looks like a recent volcanic erupt. The remains of a recent volcanic eruption everywhere you look. So these yeah, two are forced. Rock. No. Yeah. yeah so is. these two are forced to kind of work together. It's really more or less a. It was really a cold war story. Let's be real. That's what this is. Yeah. Yes. It's an allegory for, and, and to the point where even the Drock language and everything that it's kind of derided from or whatever the word you want to look for derived from kind of comes from Russian. In fact, some of the words they use are just backward Russian words and stuff like that. Yes. And, and now, the yeah. trill, the trill that Lou Gossett Jr. does in this, where his voice warbles. Yeah. Was his invention because as a kid for fun, he used to talk while gargling. Like we all do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the, like the fountains, oh, in Ep like, like the water fountains yeah, in Epcot. Too. If you've ever, if you've ever held the button down too long at Epcot at a drinking fountain, you suddenly hear 
Hey, we're drowning down here. <laughs> <laughs> And that comes up out of the drain of the water fountain. And you should see the look on a kid's face the first time they hear a voice come out of the water fountain. But yeah, he did that. He came up with that. And uh, it was a heck of a vocal effect. And he did it all with without any prosthetics in his mouth or anything like that. That was all him. Well, he now, he does have prosthetics. He when, has the false teeth. Yes. Well, those help with his accent. But one thing he discovered that he used a lot in the film, I, this I know. I don't even know where I learned this from, but I just, it might've been in one of those special effects specials or something like that. The gill thing that he has at the side of his mouth, he realized that he could catch the air in the prosthetic. So that's where he would do the <laughs> thing where it would blow out the little mm. bits of his mouth there a little bit. So it right, looked yeah. like gills or whatever. Yeah. He figured that out early on. So he used that to his advantage and there's now, some other things that he was able to do with the makeup. That's really kind of neat well, considering how constrictive that makeup probably was. It was good grief. I mean, he's, this is, this is like the only, this is comparable to, um, oh, the one with Sylvester Stallone, uh, judge dread actually, but I'm thinking the Carl urban one because urban never took the helmet off. So he does all of his acting from the nose down. It's even worse and, than that. Really? But yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, well, he's, he's his mouth and his eyes. And of course, his eyes are behind those horrendous contact lenses. So that's what I mean. He's covered oh. basically from head to toe. And even like Geary said, he doesn't even have his own teeth. They're like the only parts of of Lewis that we're really seeing that are his own are like his tongue, basically, <laughs> like, and his lips. Yeah, yeah his, that's it. That's and it. even that's it's that. the only part of his lips because, like, like I said, that's where they put that little bit over top of the end of his lips to make it look like gills. And then he figured out he could blow that out whenever he would right. do the thing or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. It's it's it's. I, I was reminded what an amazing acting job Louis Gossett Jr. did, given how constrained he was by that makeup and, and costume. I mean, I was so, probably close to being a teenager before I realized who that was. Right. Right. That's what I'm saying. Because, like, for years, I was like, okay, it's just a, whoever. And I didn't put two and two together that that was the same guy from Iron Eagle. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. Oh, no. Why, really? No, I never knew as a kid. I mean, I didn't know. The only actors I really knew as a kid were like Eddie Murphy and a couple other ones like by name. Otherwise, and Bill Murray and stuff like that. Otherwise, it was just, you know, they were, you know, people in movies to me. Like, it just did. You know, I knew who Louis Gossett Jr. was eventually. But then, like, at some point, it was like I saw the name and I'm like, wait, he's playing the alien? Like, that's Louis Gossett Jr.? You know, like, I was probably 10, 11 years old. Probably had seen the movie 20 times at that point. You know, I just never put two and two together. It just happened to finally dawn on me. Now, yeah, the, a fun fact. This will happen in 25 years. The movie takes place in, no, in less than that. Oh, yeah. The movie takes place in 2065. That seems so, so far away from 1985. <laughs> Man, your Mickey uh, Mouse is stupid. <laughs> so, I love that. I'm sorry what I said about your Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is great. That he just comes up with no, Mickey Mouse <laughs> and, and has to go with it after that. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like they stole that for Guardians of the Galaxy with uh, Kevin Bacon in a weird way. I was kind of. It kind of harkened back. That's what made me think of it when he did that. Because, like you said, he has to kind of run with it now, right? <laughs> you know? Exactly. Right. Yep, that's got to be our main philosopher. <laughs> now, here's a bit of trivia, and I don't know if you knew about this, Tom. This is also a sci-fi reimagining of Hell in the Pacific with Toshiro Mifune and Lee. Oh, Harris. okay. I never even thought of that, but I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I said it's a very common story trope, right? Like, it's... Two enemies from two different worlds. Forced to live together. Forced to work together. together to survive. Exactly. And it's a very old t tale. And like I said, it's been done in a million TV shows. It's been done in tons of comics, I'm sure. It's Cartoons. a classic trope. It is. Yeah. Yep. It is. And if anybody's ever seen the film Hell in the Pacific, uh, you'll know what I'm saying is the concept is so great because of the language barrier. And uh, and that's what's happening in this film. And they're forced to learn a little bit of each other's language. Well, what we also learn is, and I think that surprises Dennis Quaid's character, is that, um, you know, he can actually speak 
some English and he understands some words already. So he's already ahead of the game of him and he ends up turning yeah. around and teaching him Drac. So again, in a weird way, you know, this is how you do, you know, progressive entertainment without it feeling like it's beating you over the head. Like we get nowadays, because it really was painting the U S is like, yeah, you guys are kind of not paying attention to the other culture here. You're just worried about whatever you, you know, in the cold war aspect of it. Right. Cause that, let's be clear. The earth is represented by the U S here with Dennis Quaid. He's an all American country boy. He's a good old boy. You don't give don't. There's a reason why he was cast in that role. And instead of using the whole black white thing, like they would nowadays, this was more like, we don't understand our enemy. And that's why we don't understand. That's why we're scared of them is, you know, just cause we don't understand them. Right. Yeah, and exactly. at that time, especially with the cold war, it was kind of coming near an end. It was, you know, this was the same year Rocky ended it single-handedly, but, uh, you know, it took a few more years for that to take effect and everybody to figure it out. But uh, no, it was kind of a weird time. And I'm sure you guys remember who were a little older than I do, but I mean, even as a kid, I remember it was a real weird time of transition because we went from Russia being this ultimate evil to like, you know, by the end of the decade, you got reagan and bush chumming around with uh, gorbachev and shit right like so it was yep. like a whole 180 was, it, from where we started the decade yes i mean it was it was it was a it was a shock because even all of the supposed experts did not predict that the soviet union was going to collapse that it was going to fall apart and we right up through the 80s I mean, I remember when the Berlin Wall came down, I was like, oh my goodness, right. this is it. This is which this of is course was an accident, by the way. It was. Yeah. It was just a screw up. But it, yeah, it somebody was, misunderstood it was, and then they went and did it. And it's like, well, that's it. It's it's done. That was, <laughs> like, and that was the first the domino. Back in the bang now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we, yes, it was right up until that that screw up, you know. It, it was oh you know Ronnie Ray Gun is going to start World War Three. <laughs> right. We're all being told about how I dangerous heard that term in a while. Holy yeah. shit, Ronnie Ray Gun, yeah. <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> you know, Star Wars. Yeah, yeah they made something. fun of it. If 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 Democrat had uh, had said something about the Star Wars program, they would have been great. Even though it was already in the plans all the way back to Jimmy Carter. No, but yeah. I'm glad you're bringing all that up, Red Shirt, because, yeah, this is the stuff that reminds me of people when they're, like, in the woke stuff and the social justice shit. It's like, you guys have no clue. We went through the tail end of civil rights, the tail end of the Cold War, the yep. falling of the Berlin Wall. You don't know shit about making progressive moves, right? We were there in the midst of all this. Now, I was a little kid, right? right. I watched this, this shit happen. To yeah, me, I, I grew up in a world where this, we were like free for the first time in the nineties. It felt like we actually could, you know, breathe for once. Yeah, it, it, it was, I mean, it, it, people who didn't live, you know, people, if you see something, you see one of the old training films that has duck and cover and kids in grade schools jumping underneath their right. desks. My first wife had to do duck and cover drills. I never did, but I'm about the age where I would I have. Yeah, I, I mean, but but things. that that hung over everything in the news, in in you know talking about Vietnam. What if this expands? Um, the way they're talking about Ukraine now, this is all of this is like it was a different. You you had to have a, a you have to have an understanding for this movie to make as much make the way it was viewed at the time. Right, you've got to have that background, or at least intellectually. But I can tell you emotionally, this was a this was a huge thing for everybody in, who watched this movie because it was you lived with it every day. Well, and it was a big, huge, hot topic still, right? And that's one thing I yeah. do remember. And I, and I joke that Rocky single handedly ended the Cold War, but it, it kind of not wrong. It kind of did help yeah, did. the whole movement. It did. It, it, did. Uh, it really put it on this level of. Yeah, what the fuck are we even fighting about? We're fighting about shit our grandparents were fighting about. And what are they really what were they really fighting about? It was really boiled down to we just didn't understand each other. You know, of course there was the World War II thing. There was a lot going on, you know, like there was a lot in the earlier generations that we had to still sort out, but it got to a point where it's like, yeah, why are we fighting against each other when we could really be working together and I mean for a while there things seemed to be like pretty peaceful outside of the middle east i mean like 
right. it, it, it was pretty, uh, pretty, uh, you know, cool to feel like we actually kind of had gotten past that shit. Cause I caught the, like I said, I caught, the t- I couldn't imagine living. I've seen the videos or the film strips things and all that stuff. I couldn't imagine living in a world where they're like, yeah, just duck and cover under your, de- your desk. That'll save your ass from a nuclear bomb. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, no, it's more and like and you're so ducking you know, and covering. You better just kiss your ass goodbye at that. That's point. exactly yeah. because yeah, the, 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 nobody actually believed that. I don't think anybody actually believed that. Yeah, I, I think mean, that was were, the ongoing joke is they were just getting into permission, uh, getting you into position to kiss your own ass goodbye. Exactly. Yes, there were people who had real bomb shelters behind their, you know, under or behind their houses, but most of them were, you know, totally ridiculous as far as, you know, if anything actually happened. It was all just, you know, it was all try not to think about it was really the mentality. And yeah. this movie is right set right in the context of the end of that. Um, well, where, because again, before that, my memory was we were constantly on this verge of, well, we could go to war with Russia at any time. Because I remember my dad saying that shit all the time. Yes. Well, but the, 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 the press was beating. The, that's why I was saying about the way the press referred to Reagan. Um, you know, as it turned out, Reagan had had Reagan and Thatcher and the Pope between them actually helped bring about a peaceful resolution. I mean, I'm sure the Russians wouldn't be too happy about it because they went through hell for the, for a decade uh, after the collapse of the Soviet union, but at least it didn't result in a nuclear war, but we had the press telling us it was going to happen because we'd made the mistake of electing a guy who's going to start world war three. Where have I heard that before? And I won't go there, but (laughs) <laughs> but this was this was this wasn't just something you you had in the back of your mind by the mid 80s when I graduated from college in 84 um this was definitely in the news this was all of the things and, and of course this is comes out right at the begin just as Ronald Re- or the year Ronald Reagan was inaugurated in a second term 85 and basically you know the press was just ramping it up And so it was on everybody's minds at the time. The press wouldn't let us forget the Cold War by then. So this movie comes out in that. And I don't know, that may have been part of the reason people didn't want to watch it because it wasn't to them, it wasn't escapism. It was a meta, you know, it was an allegory of what they were being beaten over the head with every damn day. I mean, there was a few movies you could probably use as an exception, but you're right. I never even thought about that angle of it, too. And that kind of goes with the modernisms of that we're dealing with now is at that time, you know, I mean, as a kid, I didn't see any of this shit, right? Like, I'm just watching it as a sci-fi film. But obviously, as an adult, now that I see the film, I see the, the allegories all over the damn thing. It's clear as day. We don't even have to. We didn't even have to dig into the uh, trivias to know this stuff about the. I mean, I didn't even know about the Russian words before that. I could even have told you it's a cold war metaphor, right? Like it's clear as day on, on its surface, but I mean, it does it so well and does it so entertaining and it makes, you know, how do you say his name again? Um, uh, the, the Lewis Gossett character. I forgot what his name is in the movie. It's a uh, Jerry. Oh, Jerry. Yeah. But Jerry is what he calls him. That's what I was trying to remember the short version. Yeah. I was going to say it's something like that, but yeah. And, and you know, just how charming Lewis Gossett makes the character, right? Like that's what makes it work more than anything. Um, yeah, and the physical Dennis, movement, everything about the character. Well, the just, he, just that he makes him enduring and you can tell that these, this race is mostly peaceful. Right. And, and you know, it has that star Trek element to it. It might as well be Kirk with some, you know, uh, alien race stuck on a planet. I mean, in fact, wasn't that one, um, gorn episode similar <laughs> the gorn yeah it's very similar to this too like so yeah like i could see this being a star trek episode it works so well in that respect um but and uh, we had an episode of that when the wall yeah. when shaka fell or whatever that was it's kind of an enemy mine kind of episode with well we mentioned that yeah it's been used over and over again but again you can't The thing that's tough about those episodes specifically that you, that they were able to do with this movie. I'm laughing at what Ariel Bullet just said. You guys are all wrong with alien having a baby. It's all about trans, right? Oh shit. We didn't even get to that yet. (laughs) Yeah. Men can have babies in this movie. (laughs) I want to let you know, it is out there. You can find copies of this. Some of them are expensive. Cinefx number 25 came out in 1985. 
It was just five dollars, dude. Five dollars. Uh, Cinefix magazine was the magazine for visual effects. Oh, I loved Cinefix. And I each Gloria, issue was and I loved... singularly focused on one film. Blade Runner oh. is one of the most famous. What was the sci-fi version of uh, of Blade Runner had? It was uh, oh shit, it wasn't Cine... It was the kind of like Cinefix Starlog. Starlog. Oh, Starlog did a lot of coverage, but they were more of like a fan magazine. Cinefix yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I was just saying I remember them back in the day. Effects. Yeah. And this issue, and Don Shea, I know his son, um, because Don died, but his books are now being have been turned into coffee table books. You can get them through Amazon. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, just certain issues. And this is one I've actually been trying to find for a long time, is issue 25. And that is the one that actually that's the aliens one right there. Well, and that movie right there is one of the reasons why they turn their back a lot of at Fox because I was reading in the thing here that they turned their priorities to other films, one of which was Aliens. So they already had a sci-fi movie as far as they were concerned. Yeah. But it's it's a magazine. I'm looking to, to get some time because uh, I've wanted that issue. I, I have a copy of the Blade Runner one. It's worth a fortune. Uh, if you try to buy it on Amazon, it'll cost you. Or eBay. But it Cinefix was the special effects aficionado magazine and it was done in a wide instead of tall magazine format and it was perfect bound on the sides like a book instead of a magazine and it was just a special book about special effects Mm -hmm. and they finally quit printing it in the 2000s although they do have a website for it there is a lot of similarities, Ariel. Um, I noticed that too as a kid. Between the, I mean, if you look at them side by side, they're clearly different. But yeah, God, I love that makeup. And this is the f- image right here that was used for the uh, movie poster of the two of them conf- facing each other like that. And that creature reminds me of Star Trek Two: The Wrath of Khan. Those turtle creatures, good. yeah whatever the hell they are <laughs> oh he falls down in that pit man in these and these are like pit yeah. i remember i grabbed my seat and i'm like no 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 stop fucking around get out of there <laughs> yep. those creatures are the babies of a cockroach and a centipede <laughs> here yeah. comes the sarlacc thingy yep Man, when he shoots it and it goes out, it comes out, and you see it for the first time, like fully see it, and not just the tentacle. Jesus Christ, that freaked me. Yeah, that was a that was a mouthful of teeth with a body attached to it. <laughs> that thing is creepy. no, Ariel Geary just wants it up his butt. I want everything in my. He's back. the only human that, if he were to get abducted, he would just drop trow and stick his butt up in the air and go, "What? I'm expecting you to probe me." Aren't you going to probe me? That's why they've never taken him. Yeah, he's too willing. Oh, this is cool. Oh, okay, wow. Um, wait, wait. Look, look at this message, Gary. Yeah, I saw it. Okay. It's what I was just talking about. You interrupt me, motherfucker. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe. Martin's like, son of a bitch. Look at my picture. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe, uh, like the video, click the bell icon if you guys want to get notifications. Always double check because we're finding a lot of our, our followers are not getting the updates and they've been uns- unsubscribed. So, Dude, I, I received the uh, notifications for John's show today. Yeah, me too. Not really? last night. Yeah. Oh my god. That's been happening yeah. to me lately, I've noticed, is all of a sudden um somebody'll do a stream and then I won't get an alert till like three hours after the stream is done. Yep, look, I've seen it as well. Look who's <laughs> reaching. <laughs> oh my god, Penny. Oh really Penny. <laughs> he used oh. to be a really nice person. 
<laughs> I blame you for watching that. us. We've really? corrupted her. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely ruined Penny. Oh, uh, let me find a. Uh, whoops. I'm uploading files right now. Please give it a second. Okay. I'll let you know when they're done. They're done. Do whatever you're going to do. Uh, Awkward silence. Womp, womp, womp. It's called dead air. Okay. I have you this one for you. Penny. Shut up, E. Clay Thomason. Dick. Of course, do what you're going to do is what Gary says every time. Open your back door, baby. Loosen your hands as I show you my key. Oh my God! I'm so sorry, Tom. I didn't. I didn't. That's ah, all good. I think we all knew where the joke was going. <laughs> <laughs> In my butt. Exactly. Uh, yep. <laughs> no, it's almost is. funnier that I did get cut off. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So here is the the lenses. They are up for sale at the prop store. Wow. As well as the uh, mold of his teeth. Crazy. And those wow. are the pros the mold for the prosthesis teeth. Mm. Uh, or is that no, that is the prosthesis that fit over his teeth. That's yeah. what that is. And those are the lenses, and they are available at the prop store. They are big, man. They're and he, huge. again, here's that photo of Dupuy, the, the artist that created the makeup that he wears. It took three hours to get him into. Didn't Chris Wayless also have something to do with designing it? Thought, Chris Wayless. Let me look that up real quick. I might be wrong, but I thought he did. I could be wrong. For those who don't know who he is, he worked on, of course, Gremlins, and he designed the baby dragons and uh, Dragon Slayer, and he did Fly 2, and he designed the fly in the first film. And he also worked on uh, Ghostbusters, I guess I found out later on, too. He was one of the main designers on Slimer. And the uh, terror dogs, I think, also as well. He has a distinct okay. style. Though. That's why I, I, it looks very wayless. That's why, yeah. Uh, Tim is pitching a movie here. <laughs> I could be completely wrong. Though. Backdoor probing starring Gary and Tom. <laughs> Hurry up and get it over with. That's the tagline. <laughs> I'm, I'm not finding the connection. Let me just go to IMD. I could be completely wrong. Yeah, I, I could be. Because he could have been working on the fly at that point already. Just for some Which reason, I uh, it was another I, I, film that was covered by Cinefax. Oh no, he's in the makeup right. department. That's what I thought. Okay, yeah, I, I could just tell by his work. Yep, right. Like, he is certain, in there. I just saw him. Yeah, there's certain artists you can just, you know, like I'm sure you can tell just by as being a you know an artist of drawing. Yeah, it's like paintings and drawings. I can spot a, a Hildebrandt. Like I can Even spot like uh, I know the way they uh, draw. Stan Winston's work, you know, and and Screaming Mad George, I can tell his shit right away. Um, there's certain makeup artists you can see their stuff, and you're just like, oh yeah, that's so and so. Obviously, you know, Geiger's designs are easy to pick out, but I mean, that's a good example of what I'm getting at. You know what I mean? And what really sucks today is so many artists um, imitate too much other artists, and it's like uh, I'm a student of Drew Struzan. But yet I hardly ever use his well, style because I, I do things my own way. Wayless gives it, he's got a dead giveaway because he does scales a certain way. And he does, he, he loves having his little spikes. Yeah. <laughs> and the way he does them. See right there. Look at the it's makeup. It's like ridgeline. It's ridgeline spikes. They're like Now bones. compare that to the gremlins and compare that to the dragon. The dragons. And, yes. Yeah. They look, he's got this specific thing that he likes to do. And I don't know if he has like a. He must have a pattern that he uses or something that for his scales that they all look the same. Like they just, I, I see it right away. And it's just like, if you see an Alex Ross painting or something like that, you know, instantly who it is. Oh my God. They do. <laughs> uh, yeah, and actually they had several people that work for Chris Wallace. So, yeah, I mean, he was a pretty big one, deal. He's one of the two, more undersung guys. That's why I like to bring him up because people, I mean, four, five, his career kind of, I mean, he went, I think he went kind of more behind the scenes again after uh, Fly 2, but, you know, that was supposed to be his big 
breakout film because he had worked on the makeup for the original fly and then they let him direct fly too and of course box office wise it didn't fly 33 personnel on the effects department worked for him for his company yeah he was a pretty big deal back then yeah and that's including himself by the way i included him chris wallace of course uh alien creature he's somebody i'd love to talk to in an interview And he's still alive, dude. We should try to reach him. Sometime. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, he released a, a documentary of sorts, I guess you could call it. Really what it was was an... <laughs> I actually paid to watch. This was during COVID. Um, and it just so happened that... He, and it was like just happenstance that otherwise I would have never seen this documentary. I see it in quotations because it's more like a fancy YouTube video, let's say. But it's really just Wayless sitting there and talking to us in an interview form. And then he's commenting over video from Gremlins. So it's literally just 90 minutes of behind the scenes footage of Gremlins. And it's it's fucking amazing to see all the stuff they did. But like I just would have never even seen it had it not been during COVID in this theater that was showing it actually made it available on streaming at the same time as they were showing it in the theater. But it's, uh, and he talks about it for like 90 minutes or so. It's like, yeah, I'd love to talk to him about all the stuff he's worked on, not just Gremlins, but I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, he's one of those and guys. And I'm going to share this real quick because this guy uh, is obvious when you look at the set design. Um, is uh, Zihet uh, Bauer, uh, Rolf. Oh, yeah. I can see for Never Ending Story. Uh, yeah. Again, there is this connection to that film. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought there might have been. Yeah, and then we've got Tony Emmy. He's the um, uh, director of photography on this flick, and uh, he's got a great career, too, going back to, to the 70s. And this, is, I and, guess, has got to be kind of disappointing to for Wolfgang because this would have been his follow-up to uh, Never Ending Story as well. Yeah. So... Yeah, I wanted to show. Oh, wait, that. which because I think that came out in '84, right? Yeah, so yeah, yes, '84. I just double checked. I think we're past it, but and we just lost Rolf. He just died two years ago. The set I decorator. I think we're past the scene, but. <clears throat> where they start arguing about each other's philosophers <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and lewis and 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 jerry calls uh mickey mouse, mickey a mouse. Big dope. yeah that was a while ago yeah, yeah that's right but, it's a big the, dope he's not yeah but the funny thing is i like, just isn't a trivia here quaid walks away with a noticeable smirk making snorting noises he's like he's He's yeah, but that's but what's interesting from this is it's the only take where Quaid didn't burst out laughing at the Mickey Mouse line. So they kept the one where he's going, he walks away stifling laughter because it was the closest they could get to him having a non reaction. And he was corpse, apparently, he was corpsing through that all the takes on that scene until that one. And this is the part where basically says, I need to go exploring. If we don't go looking around, we're going to die. Yeah, and, they're getting cabin. They're getting cabin. Well, he's getting cabin fever. And Whether, you look at Jerry here and he's crying. Yeah. Yes. Well, and we discover that Jerry is being resistant, not just because he's wants to stay put, but because he. He's pregnant. He can't. He's pregnant. Their species are uh, ambisexual. That means they're like earthworms. Um, they're capable of uh, doing both genders work. Well, basically, it's set up that Jerry comes from a single parent society, but the parenting comes in from both the single parent plus the community like raises the children kind of thing is the way it's set up looks like kind of thing so it's like a communal liberals. thing but they're, they're liberals <laughs> it takes a village it takes yeah a village. yeah 
Canary I mean, is crying. That was let's great. be real yeah. though. That was very a progressive idea for the time, but they weren't anything thinking about the kind of shit you would now, right? Like it wasn't. No. It was just put in there because it was a very sci-fi idea, right? It's yes. a very the, Star Trek. That's the thing kind of is thing. we yeah. we were all a little bit progressive back in the day. We all were. Yeah. The problem is when people go too far with it, and that's what bugs us because we're good with a lot of the things that they're saying. The problem yeah. is how they're saying it. And to the extent they're saying it, that we have. See, a this movie's with. trying to say it's science fiction. Men can't get pregnant. <laughs> I wonder though if the Catholic Church had a problem with that back in the day. Uh, I don't recall anything about this movie being debated with the Catholics. No, there were films no, that they were going after in the eighties. That's was what I was saying. At that time, they didn't even think about like this was not even a thought. Like Thanks. men could have babies wasn't a thing until like the last decade. That's a new they, thing, yeah. They were still arguing about life of Brian back then. That was going to say that was more. Oh on my their god, agenda. yeah, they went after that. They're only like a couple of years guys. away from the last temptation of Christ and losing the mind over that. But yeah, yes, yes, that would have kept them busy. Yeah. But it yeah, did some, for a little while. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. I mean, this, this movie, film credit Janet Janet Maslin deemed this movie this season's Dune. Basically referring Ouch. to the critically pan sci-fi movie of the previous year, which is Lynch's Dune from 1984. They were both panned Ouch. mercilessly by the critics. Which is ironic because Lynch was also offered this, according to IMDb as well. <laughs> that would have been worse. That is ironic. That would have been interesting. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. I've got some uh, bit of trivia the, for you The guys. baby birth scene would have been really wacky. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, he's going to rip him open. He has to rip him, split his belly. But this is another thing that a lot of people don't know, is that there is a bit of narration in this film, and the narrator was none other than Tom Baker. He's uncredited. I thought he was a narrator for a trailer. I was going to say, I thought it was oh, just and, a trailer. And he it's, is and credited I think... on IMDb as the narrator. Interesting. I was gonna say there might have been an opening bit or something. There's like one or two, and then there's a. See, that's the other thing too, because some of this is making sense to me now after watching it last month and finding out how tumultuous this was. This movie feels like there was a lot missing or something happened in the production that it didn't get finished correctly. So that might have been. I think there is a bit in the middle where there's a narrator that just comes in out of nowhere and starts explaining a few things, and you're just like, "Wait, what?" And then, that's where like, Quentin yeah. Tarantino got, got his idea end from. Too, I think, wasn't it? At the very end, they have the narrator come in, too. Yes, that's Tom Baker. Yep, okay. So I think you're right. I think you're correct. But he also did the trailer as well. Yep. Guys, it's the top of the hour. Oh, no. Do we turn yeah. in a We have to listen to Tom do, doing um, uh, this trailer. Here we go, guys. Meet the Seattle Vigilante. Like so many comic heroes, this warrior hides his identity. But his identity isn't the only secret he has to keep. After grievous wounds received during combat, Tier 1 operator John Russell begins to recover and comes to terms with his new reality of being an amputee. And as he learns how to use his new prosthetic limb, he finds himself caught up in the bureaucratic red tape that too many wounded veterans experience, the exhausting medboard process. Out of sheer frustration, John takes it out on the criminal scum of the city. But when reality kicks in, John realizes he started something that's having an impact on the greater world around him, and thus has to reevaluate his motives. And moreover, just how far is John willing to go to finish this war he's declared against the criminals in Seattle? And will he even survive? From the creator of IDW's award-winning graphic novel, Code Word Geronimo, comes a new story about a different kind of warrior, Vindicated Inc., the first of its kind disabled veteran action hero comic. The Vindicated Inc. graphic novel crowdfunding campaign on FundMyComic.com is provided in the description of this video. We hope you become a contributor. Please share this link. Thank you. Thanks again for that, Tom. So, but, uh, Hey, uh, another thing you can do right now is, uh, go to YouTube and listen to the entire soundtrack, which is available on YouTube for free. 
right here. I'm going to share the link in the chat. This is the isolated soundtrack by Moni Charé. And there it is, the entire soundtrack. Nice. And yeah. we, ha we have a petition from Eakley. Oh, he's he wants he wants that, huh? Oh no, fuck you guys. <laughs> nah. Oh no, not watching. that again. What is that under? Is that on Saturday? What is that? I think that's on the other one. Uh, under Saturday? No, it's not I'm not seeing it. Anima really? went by in secret and deleted. Where did we put that? I don't remember where it's at. That because you would put it just back. Military Monday? No, it's not under there. I'm, at, I'm actually trying to talk to you, Martin. You're not responding at all. Oh, I don't know what is it. When I say we, I'm referring to you and me. It might be in one for Wednesday. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Well, maybe you had a reasonable moment and took it down yourself. No, it was <laughs> up there. I just played it again the other day. <laughs> Moist. <laughs> Moist. <laughs> Cake is moist, and it's one of the few things on this planet that should be considered moist. It's cake. Yeah, my daughter doesn't like that word either. She gets that's a that's a trigger word for her. Another thing I always I, felt I'll was weird is the introduction of the um, scavengers not coming in until the third act, and then we finally meet Brian James and can't understand. You know, you you see this guy, and it's hard to really hate him because he's only been on screen for a couple minutes. In the third act, so they the, the, the there was uh, something in here. Uh, the, the the studio for some reason decided to for that said they wanted them to add a mine as a as in a mining operation, but because for some reason they thought that the, the audience would would not recognize enemy mine the word mine as a possessive my enemy. Yeah. So they decided to throw that in. So I think that's part of the reason that the scavengers show up it, so late in the movie, because it was something the studio just said, stick it in there, which just once again goes to the the discussion of what a disastrous production this was in so many ways. And they had to stay with it because they had apparently they had paid. Uh, Dennis Quaid and Louis Gossett Jr. significant contracts, expensive contracts to make the movie. And they would have had to pay them with, even if they abandoned the project. So they said, well, we might as well make it. And that's where the, that's why it comes out. And it is, it, it does have some disconnected feeling. You know, it, it has some things that feel disconnected about it. Like you just said, they're the, it's, it, where did the it's scavengers all in the third come act. from? Yeah. This movie just like, they just decide, okay, guys, and we were talking about it before with, in, in, with respect to... Let's like, wrap Stephen it up King's quick. Stories. Exactly. Well, we got to end this, guys. You're running out of money here. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, has its, it has its issues, most of which I think came from a, a thoroughly disastrous uh, production process for the movie. And, uh, you know, it's a shame because it was based on a novella that... that looked, they they tried to follow, and for the most part, I think did. I haven't read it. I will admit, but a number of things say they'd made changes specifically to follow the, the the source material. But then once again, you know, the studio exec stepped in and and started stirring the pot. And how many times have you heard that about a movie that turned it into a, you know, what would have been a great movie into a good movie or a good movie into a terrible disaster? And the the critics hated this. I mean that's part of the reason it just disappeared. I think from the box from from movie theaters. Uh, yeah, because it, it was it, it was here and then it was gone. Yep. Uh, by the way, here is the book. It is available on um, Amazon. 
Kindle mm-hmm. edition. It was originally published in a- Isaac Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine. And uh, I don't even Spike. see a, pr- a two ninety nine price. Would you Kindle. please uh, share that in in the chat? I maybe i don't know maybe i don't think i will no no not gonna fuck you guys <laughs> it's by barry long year i'm looking to see if they actually have a share link on the page but i don't see one which is odd because they're usually shorter i hate these really long ones when i go up here yeah it's like crazy long so here it is um Enemy mine. Book. Oh, maybe. What did That's you say, Gary? Wrong address. There you go. What'd you say? Look at Ariel says. I mean, yeah, that, that may apply those to you. joke that was made. It's true, though. Anima, Anima, mine. She is mine. Mine, 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 mine. Except when I say moist. I don't know why. Yeah, fuck yeah. off. <laughs> what the fuck? Moist. Moist. <laughs> you want me to leave, huh? No. Then stop doing that, jerk. Jerk. So let's see who all is here right now. We've got uh, um, E. Clay Thompson dropped in. Cl- Christian Delorme, Real Wade Nation Gaming is here. Wade is here. Ariel Ballet is here, and Peter Vickman Fanside, Vickman's girl. So that's eh, awesome. Get back to the. Uh, I need to put in my password. No. <laughs> oh, it's like he's yelling my name wrong. Okay, but are we so silent? I'm actually still looking up a PDF copy of Cinefax magazine, so oh. I'd love to show that before we end the show. I am not having any luck. I can do that one. Okay. <laughs> what's that Gary turn a little wider and say ah <laughs> I don't wanna I don't wanna All right, I can, oh, I can buy them over on Apple. That's nice. And actually buy a digital copy. Ah, uh, here's where, when they finally found in the, the cave. Yeah, well, they're forced to, to um, take refuge after yeah, the last storm. Have, they should have looked for a cave since the beginning. <laughs> Instead of building shelters. Well, on a planet that looks like that, a cave would be more, more likely be occupied than not. You'd have to fight whatever was living in it at the time. Yeah. By the way, uh, Vinzinger, a.k.a. is here. 
as well as, of course, our good friend, Kingsport Cal. Brian. Brian's supposed to be on the show. But he had to go do things with, with his wife today, so I get it. Life happens. And by the way, uh, Red Shirt, uh, we were talking about doing a, an episode dedicated to uh, the prisoner. Ooh. That could be interesting. Mm-hmm. Been two hours just kind of like going over the series. Oh, yeah. Science fiction series. And I'll, I, that's a hill I'll defend. That that is it a is sci fi. It's a science fiction story. It is absolutely because the village could not do what it does without all those inventions and technologies that don't exist. Even those even bouncing orbs, day. for God's sake, they're horrifying. Oh yeah, that that's a story all by itself for the production of the prisoner. But yeah, that's that's the people are still arguing about that. It's amazing to me. I mean, it's it's over 50 years old. People are still arguing about what the point of it was. And there's a there's a story that was made to confuse the critics. <laughs> yeah, those uh, by the way, the bouncing orbs scared the shit out of me as a kid. Yeah, I saw I had it nightmares it, about them. I saw it when it first aired. I was 5 years old. And I watched, I watched, what was it? Rover was the name for the, the one. Rovers, Ro yeah. Yeah. Go over and absorb that guy in the courtyard in front of number six. And <clears throat> when Rover roared, my mother heard it from upstairs in the kitchen and came down in the den and saw me watching it and ran across the room and shut the television off. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to watch it again until I was 10 years older. But yeah, that gave me nightmares. <laughs> I only watched ten minutes, five, ten minutes of the first episode. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody built a large walker in their shed, an imperial walker. I have to share this image. I'm sorry. This is amazing. That's a ladder next to it. Wow. That is huge. Yep. How did and it's posable. That? That's impressive. Fully posable. They can move the parts. This is crazy. Even Rogers Lim built this. That's incredible. Yep. Just goes to show you what a guy with a bunch of tools, a shed, and too much time on his hands can accomplish. Well, that's his other yeah, that one fire. dude. How about that um, one dude that built a full scale Viper? I was thinking about the Enterprise. Have you seen that? Yes. But the most impressive that I, I have seen has been from Halo. One, a guy that make a mechanized uh, cosplay suit of an elite. And another guy that, in fact, he built the, the Warhawk with four-wheel drive and four-wheel direction. This is it right here. Full scale Viper. Yeah, you have to share it. Full scale X Wing. Oh. Both. <laughs> wow. Un freaking believable. Just this Viper alone, because uh, this thing is huge. Oh, it has the two version of the of the uh, uh, Viper, the Mark One. Yeah, and the this Mark is II. the original Battlestar one, and this is the design for the newer one. 
I, I have a model of the Mark II that I haven't even unboxed yet. I have the model of the Mark One. I used to have, um, I had the Cylon ship, Cylon Raider, the um, Viper, and I always wanted to get the Battlestar Galactica itself model kit, but never did. Oh, it's a small model shed. It's not that big. You need a person to prove it. <laughs> David, I love the way he said his name. Yeah, this is this is the heart wrenching moment when he dies. Yep. And he doesn't even have a knife. He has to rip him open with his hands. Right. It's so barbaric. I see Parrot Heads joined us too. But the store, but the the writers, you know, the the script has done its work and the actors have done their work because at this point, you know, this is a tragic moment. They're not they're not enemies anymore. Now that's something I would love to collect too. If somebody ever took the time to make um, enemy mine action figures, mm. yeah, including we... uh, pregnant and giving birth, Drac. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to be seeing those anytime soon. <laughs> you can actually pop the belly open and reach in and grab the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a touching moment, and it's changing the direction of the film drastically. And this is where the the obligation for um, Dennis Quaid's character comes in, because he has to do what Jerry can't do now. Sadly, Ariel's correct. No, Sorry. I, th I think he has a moment where he considers not doing it, but then he sees the baby move and push against the belly, so he knows. You can't let it die. Yep. Uh, no, this movie is so ahead of its time. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Bruce. Welcome. Hi, Bruce. That's a new name, isn't it? Yes, I and I love it that it's a before. short one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you'd be loving that. But you know, when I fill in for you, Martin, I never put full names in there. Like Tim's name, I just <laughs> put Tim. Gary knows what I mean. Yeah. Or Ariel. Some of you guys just go crazy on your names. Well, the one that's always killed me is like uh, uh, Courtney. Courtney. Yeah. Just like I told her, I said, I'm never going to say your full name. I'm just going to call you Court or Courtney. Isn't she changing it too? So you can't really get She's used done to it, it a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, Anima. Charlie Bruce just messaged me. Oh. Plus, my niece messaged me again too. Oh, the baby. The baby that he doesn't know. Yeah, what the baby to feed. is like so not adorable. <laughs> it's it's like, so ugly. It's fugly. So <laughs> ugly. And it was like, oh, I would not. Why is he handling it? He should put that down. <laughs> 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 that might give him something. So like moist. <laughs> so moist. <laughs> okay, you guys say it one more time and I fuck off. I get out of it. No, you <laughs> won't. <laughs> you won't. I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that one was just ripe for the picking right there. In front I mean, of me. really was. It's covered with KY jelly. Yeah. Like literally like lube. Oh, I'm trying God. to remember <laughs> how many how many gallons did they use for the first alien movie? Oh god, tons. Oh yeah. Tons. I mean, I've been told that by a few special effects people that yeah, KY jelly gets used a lot <laughs> for a lot of different things. It's the base of a lot of things. The dripping from the alien's mouth, all of that shit. Anything that has to look glistening or gooey, yeah. I don't want to look stupid here, but what is that kind of jelly? I've never heard that name before. Um, well, it's a water-based it's jelly. jelly. It's but yeah, it's primary usage. <laughs> It's gynecological it's butt sex. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was no, it was invented. Know, it for was made doctors. by gynecological doctors. You're right. Yeah. Yes. We so in, like in the medical field, it, we it have is a, lube. A it's an early it. form. Yeah. In the medical field, okay. we refer to it as surge lube. And but it, it's, it's sterile. It's pretty versatile. Like King's port, port call is right. Like that's why they use it because it can it mixes real well with other things. The the. It's water based. Yeah. yeah, since it's water based, it doesn't erode other things and it mixes well. So you can make a slime and it doesn't, isn't going to generally hurt anybody's skin or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah it's neutral. Uh, this is, of course, the Luke and Yoda scene. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Carry me like a backpack, you will. Oh. <laughs> And this is the stuff that was shot up in Iceland, right? Probably. No, that is no, in no. Canary Islands. Isla and Canary. All Canary yeah. Islands, yeah. There you go. Because that, I mean, the Gran Canaria is basically one volcano with a habitable strip around the foot of the thing. I wouldn't want to live there. I've been on Fuerteventura, and it really looks like that. It's like the the island is a dry cookie, and wherever plants grow, oh ho ho ho, water. Look who we have here. Hello. You made it. Hi. I did, as promised. Only an hour and a half late, but good to have you here. Ah, but who's here? And who's counting? I was hey, always with you in spirit. Oh. <laughs> How you been, man? <laughs> oh, God. That was like the longest lineup in the history of lineups. Oh, so. thank God. I thought you were going to say that was the longest shit. Uh, that was that was earlier today. <laughs> so, Not everybody's like you, Gary. Ain't gonna eat itself. That's right. Yeah, everybody is just like me. Everybody. There's even a book out there, Anna. It's called Everybody Poops. That's right. Yeah. Everybody like you. poops. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> and this kid, by the way, really good performance by this kid. Oh yeah, totally. Yes. Because he wants to be human. I want to have five fingers. As he says, I want to have four or five. Mm. That's I cute. want to have four or yeah. five. Mm. It's adorable, this little kid. Yeah. I mean, it started ugly, but it is kind of cute once it's grown a bit. It grew out of its ugliness. It's like when you were born, you were apparently sculpted by someone that wasn't very good. Yeah. I was possibly on drugs. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a bad trip. I, I don't want to say you were gross, but you were really moist. <laughs> <laughs> there was a couple of fumbles, a couple of drops, but we don't talk about that. No, we don't talk about <laughs> drops. I found out real quick that babies bounce. <laughs> yeah, bounce. exactly. <laughs> Your skeletal structure at the time is soft, you know? If you catch it on the second They're bank, like nature's know. rubber ball. <laughs> exactly. Like Tiggers. Yes. That's right. Oh, Penny did it oh, again. There it's it is. She's talking about KY penny. jelly. Great for backdoor. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Pretty much. Yeah. So she gets the backdoor Kings video. There you go. Kings for Kels at like this. <laughs> Do we have any backdoor in so here? Fucked up. No, we don't. Yeah. This one, I don't think so. You, uh, Zach. Oh. Not in there either. Uh, so go, go to the main. Thing. Go to the main. I am going to the main. Sweet Jesus. Calm down. Please, Mommy and Daddy, don't argue. Yeah. Here's your, here's your backdoor video. 
I think they left. And if zombies do get in, Louise will protect us with her amazing archery skills. Yeah, but we really don't know how to kill them yet. Maybe they love being shot by arrows. Maybe it's like a deep tissue massage for them. Oh no, isn't there a back door? Should we barricade that? It's steel and, and locked. I checked it. <laughs> oh, well, it was nice to have you here, Ariel, as always. And Take care, Happy Ariel. Bye, Ariel. Later. Alligator. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more funny than somebody who's not American using American euphemism. I know. That's why I'm here. The comedy relief. Oh, I don't know. I think now, Americans. By the way, use, I think Americans using the term "bloody" is funnier. One of the things I'd really like to know about this film is in the casting process, a lot of times, and this is an actual fact, that many roles that Dennis Quaid would get were roles that were turned down by Harrison Ford. Hmm. I and just got done acting with a dog. I ain't acting with no lizard. Exactly. So <laughs> I wanted to find out, you know, and you just, there's so little known about this film behind the scenes. And it, it bugs me because the people are, a lot of them are still alive, but we're going to lose these people. And one day we're going to lose the story of the making yeah. of this film. Yeah. And I've always been curious if this was another one of those films that Harrison Ford rejected that went to the Dennis Quaid. I mean, dra what was that? Uh, the one with the talking dragon, Sean Connery, um, that originally dragon. they went for Ford trying to get him dragon. to play the part. Dragonheart? Dragonheart. Yeah. And Ford's like, uh, no. <laughs> the way Tom does the impression of him, no. Uh, Penny's got to go, too. All right, Penny, take care. Have a good day today. Later, Bye, Penny. Penny. <clears throat> so long, Penny. Keep keep making those backdoor jokes, but not with, not with your grandkid. That would be just weird. Oh, this kid is so cute. Mm. And there's something very locust-like on the back of their head. Because that looks like the belly of a, of a cicada. Yeah. I've always noticed that. You know, just wondering, you know, how squishy that was in the back. Every time I've seen it. And on yeah, the side, too. You went to it, yeah. it. Yeah. You're, you're weird. I know. Poke it with a stick. Yeah. <laughs> See if it makes a farting sound. I think uh one of the other weak things is the um the hair in the quaid looks really fake. Mm. But this is really visually it's, this is a really good film. Yeah. I think it's the way it parts on the top of his head that looks like a wig. Mm. It's too thick. Was, you should be able to see a bit of the skin. Or something. Like right here, it looks like real hair. But there are shots sometimes where it just looks like he, he's wearing a wig. Like it was mm. a pickup shot and he already cut his hair. See, and this he always reminded me as kind of like a sci-fi Robinson Crusoe kind of character. Like, you know, later on in the film, right? When he's looking all gnarly. It's very, there's a lot of similarities with that story. This one, uh, closer to Hell in the Pacific. Hmm. Two enemy soldiers having to, that speak different languages, having to learn to survive together. Become dependent on one another. Oh, it's okay. Delete it. Don't feel bad about it. Oh, uh, yeah. These jerks. <laughs> yeah, and there's big old fucking Brian James, and the way he tosses his kid around like it's he's a rag doll is real yeah. with Brian James. That dude was a giant and a beast. Mm. One of my favorite stories about him is when Josh was working on Crime Wave. And he went into the local Holiday Inn or Marriott uh, bar that was in the you know downstairs restaurant area, 
and he mm. he just he was coked up man went in there wanting to fight everybody and ran everybody out of the bar <laughs> emptied the bar out oh, god there are other stories uh because i don't know if you ever knew this i'm the one who uh announced his death to the world through the family oh yeah hmm. that day sucked Mm. Plus, I did the official bust of him, the statue, for his family for the uh, golf tournament. There, they have a golf tournament named after Brian James in Los Angeles. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. We got a picture of that statue. Hold on. If I can find it real quick. There it is. Share my screen. And see, there's this huge jump now. Yep. And it's so off-putting the way they did that. Uh, oh. Was the original sculpture itself? Wow. And here it is. Here with the test base that the um, uh, bronzing guy did. And then here is the bronze statue he produced with the um, plaque. And this is a little back and forth animated showing what it looked like. Damn, dude, that's nice. It was a very good likeness. I was pretty proud of that statue. There you go. So I love these shots of the space station. I, and they're just so damn quick. And you're like, they built all these hallways and, and um, only it's only in the film for a brief period. Mm. They're still on the studio tour. Parts of it are apparently still on the studio tour in Bavaria. Really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wow. The, the the deck, the floor was made out of Marston mat, pure steel planking, like temporary airfields in World War II, or you know, quick and dirty airfields. And then they used some sort of uh, ventilation mesh, like the side of a computer case or something for the walls so that's what you can see all the, they, the, the basically this all little holes drilled in steel panels and they just repurposed them from from other things and and built the set out of it and it did really well and of course for those of you who don't know uh bavaria is uh between austria and germany it is a part of germany the most southern yeah. <laughs> well it's a state of germany <laughs> yeah all the pladuch people live my problem with this was um, they show you he's on the station all of a sudden you don't know where you don't know yeah how. it's so weird but this whole scene just, goes so quickly it's rushed like how the fuck did he get there imagination and yes munich is the capital of bavaria München. i love the cream mm. <laughs> okay. Bavarian cream donut. Mm -hmm. oh, They're the best, dude. Should. Seriously. Yep. My my brain had to translate it to German to figure out you meant the dessert. <laughs> <laughs> uh another one that I like, uh that's I don't I can't remember is it uh, who makes the blends? It's another pastry, oh. the Dreamfield pastry. Uh, I think Demers. Oh. They're like rolled crepes with cream inside. Are they Swedish or German or? I'm trying to, let me look it up real quick. Oh, I'm trying to remember. There we go. It's a rolled pancake, Jewish cuisine. Oh, it's Jewish. It's Hebrew. Oh, okay. 
Oh, yeah, New York, I, I, would, I always associate blintzes with New York delis. Cheers. And it's mm. more associated with the Slavic country. It just sounds like a German or, yeah, I was going to say kind of word. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. well, Yiddish. Because almost everything Yiddish. fattening is German. True. <laughs> Yiddish is, is German words spell, uh, but True. written with, with Hebrew letters. Mm. Mm. So the, the, that makes the, sense. The, yeah. It's basically a version of German that was written differently. That's all. Mm. With slightly different, in, you know, connotations to some of the words. <laughs> right. I like a, this shot here, this miniature. That is so cool looking. Yeah. By the way, here's a blintz right there. Oh, God. Now I'm getting hungry. Yep. <laughs> See, my mom is German. My dad's Austrian. I just, oh, God. All the food was so good. Anyway. I keep forgetting of Austrian roots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Kingsport. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know us. What do you expect? At least they are not talking pastries after seeing the baby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, next for your entertainment, we'll get into Yiddish food on top of that next. So I love these spatial shots. Uh, they're mm -hmm. really good. I don't know if they're matte paintings or what, but the, the planets look really well airbrushed. Mm. Yeah, I think this is ILM's work. This miniature is definitely mm. not ILM. That is definitely the company that did um, uh, Never Ending Story. Cause yeah, no, I meant they the, love I doing meant the wire work. I meant the backgrounds. The spatial stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the credit for them was oddly specific at the end of the movie. <laughs> it was ILM. It did back matte paintings and backgrounds. <laughs> and of course, here's the mine scene, enemy mine, uh, with the alien uh, Drac slaves. Right. I wonder what the symbolism is here. I mean, even if the studio, well, I mean, even if the, yeah. Even if the studio uh, mandated this because of the stupid, uh, you know, title and them getting uh, confused, it adds an element, though, to the story I think is unique or at least interesting because, you know, you have the Dennis Quaid character in this dilemma of, okay, these people could help me get the hell out of here, mm. but they also have all these Drax as slave labor, right? Yeah. So is what does he do? You know, he's got to come up with solutions. So I mean, I, I don't hate it as part of the story. It just, yeah, it does feel like it kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah, it's it's just that it feels tacked on. That's all. I mean, I think yeah, I think yeah, right. It does work until the the last part. Of but the again, movie. we're stuck in this situation where this feels like it's a trilogy that's been truncated down into one movie, and the longer yes. you get into the movie the less and less we're getting of the rest of the story, right? Like, right. Well, I, I do remember back in the early nineties talking to Barry Longyear, like the author of the book. And he did feel that it was, he was a little disappointed of the ending and that it was a little bit rushed. He thought in his, in his mind, you know, being his story and everything. So, and he just wished it could have been a little bit longer, just like the book, but yeah, that's Hollywood for you. Yeah, no novel ever survives contact with Hollywood. No. Hmm. No. Although he did give me good writing tips. So. I think one of the uh, worst ones is Blade Runner because the original novel the name comes from is nowhere in the movie. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, <Runner> right. <laughs> oh, it's actually called Blade Runner, the, uh, a movie. Mm. And that was turned into a novel. Well, wasn't <laughs> wasn't Blade? They wasn't wasn't it what? originally based on "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep"? Well, yes. The, yes. I'm talking about the other book. Oh, the other book that they got the name from. Oh, okay. Uh, which is actually mm. about a medical, an underground medical supplier of organs and and uh, equipment. They're runners. They run medical equipment, blade runners. Ah. 
And Hampton Fancher, real not Hampton Fancher, I'm sorry. Uh, the executive producer. Oh my god, I just forgot his name. Oh my god, I cannot believe this. I gotta look it up. Michael Dealey. He was the EP on the film. And he, Hampton Fancher, went, and Ridley, went to buy the book title. That's all they did. They just wanted the title. Hmm. And of course, it was William S. Burroughs that wrote the novel. I'm sure you guys know who that is, right? Uh, very weird dude, yes. <laughs> yeah. So this is great. He mm -hmm. finds Zamis for some reason being held in this cage in the floor. Well, there are other drugs dead drags in similar cages so you could assume that some is all i get too to much say is trouble. these scavengers are terrible and uh if people want to send hate to me over that joke go right ahead And this is the part. Yeah. When they decide not just kill Davidge, but first punish him by hurting the boy. Well, the drag. It's not a boy, mm. the kid. But the payback is awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very satisfying deaths. Yeah, and now we now now the movie turns into Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> right, yeah. I know yeah. it does yes. kind of take a, a very much really? of that vibe. It, yeah, mm -hmm. there's so many little vibes throughout the film. The the Luke running around with Yoda on his back. Um, oh yeah, you can definitely tell there's a lot of Star Wars and indie. Oh yeah, a little bit of Star Trek in here. Hey, BTA oh, yeah, man, where are you? But you know what? I didn't mind. No, no, it works with it. Yeah, but did oh. you enemy oh. mind? Mmm. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> and for for your uh, laugh, you get this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Really? I I've know. made my choice. <laughs> I made my choice. <laughs> I've definitely noticed too. You check out the whole package. Come on. I like that his friends, but again, it's so quick. Everything happens so quick. There's no explanation. That's why, why it feels they... like so much of this never got finished filming. Like the studio was probably pressuring Wolfgang to the point where they're like, you got like three days to finish this shit. So whatever you get done, gets done. Mm -hmm. Whatever done. doesn't get right. done is done. Done. Yeah. yeah. It feels yeah, like either it ended up on the cutting room floor or more likely, like you just said, yeah. just wasn't shot. And that's right. what makes me feel like the ending now that you brought that up again with the narration and all that shit. It's like, oh yeah, that definitely feels very tacked on and odd. And and the more I think about this third act, it's like, yeah, you're you're right. Well, the whole it does Brian kinda... James character just like suddenly there's this character. Right. There's just a lot of setup we're missing for a bunch of payoff, right? Like right. you even mentioned, yeah. like why do they you have the kid? With no setup, you know. Yeah. Chain. Well, I would imagine. Oh, maybe he tried escaping a few times or something, but they don't have that in there, and they probably right. never got to film it. Is my guess. Right. Yeah. Was, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the the you know with the amount of money they'd spent and thrown away with all the filming they did initially when they just started over. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, this thing was. I think that one one line to, said that some estimates put this movie's total budget at between forty and forty five million, which in nineteen eighty five was really a lot of money. money. Yeah, yeah, that's more like probably like two hundred million or today or so. I give or take. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to remember. Was this around an hour and a half, hour forty five minutes? Mm. It's been ages since I've seen this. Uh, IMDb. Says it's an hour and 48 minutes. Yeah. All right. Close. Yeah. So, I mean, there's still room there, like for a sci fi movie. You, they'll generally let you go two hours easy. So, to me, yeah. it feels like, yeah, our, our idea of the chances that this movie just didn't get finished filming and they just worked with whatever they had, most likely. Yep. Yeah. That would be my guess because it does feel like it's missing a good 15, 20 minutes of story, at yeah. least. At least. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Not to mention, like you said, once you cut to the end, you're like, okay, you're missing a lot here. Like, where where's all this coming from? Like, you know, there's about at least another movie or two worth of story here that you could have told. I mean, you, there's, oh, there's still a war going on, but he gets to take a bunch of uh, Drac refugees from the scavengers, that liberated from the scavengers, and take them to the Drac mm. homeworld. I mean, with what happened to the war? <laughs> Well, that's what you I'm know? saying. Like yeah. th- that almost feels like there's two or three movies we're skipping over just to get to the end of the story. Like, yes, I agree. And this is a I, great, like, you could have made a trilogy out, out of it. Yeah, way. exactly. This is a great composite yeah. shot. It, it's, it's like, um, I'm not sure if it's one met painting or not, but the composite is on the, on the bottom left there. The only thing real is the first row of, of the Drac aliens. The, yeah. them walking towards the guys and the guys standing at the end and then the rest of the the alien the drac aliens is a matte painting and then they have the composite of a real ocean and i don't even know if that light source is with that or not but see and then it is, almost makes me wonder if this is only on there just because they had this shot done <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. like, it's like yeah. we got this shit done we're gonna use it so you're just going to slap it on at the end you know, like, instead of <laughs> filming some other. We'll ending, have you know? Dr. Who narrate the ending. Yeah. Yeah. We got a buck 20. Like with Superman, this is the shot we're going like with. with Superman. They're like, well, this ain't the original ending. We don't care. We we've got the video or the uh, special effect of him d- sh- circling around the earth. We're going to use it. God damn it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. One way or the other. Yeah, this almost does feel like something that wound up in the film in post production. Mm. We got the shot. We'll do some stuff with it. ILM can do some matte paintings. We'll get uh, Tom Baker to narrate it, and <laughs> we'll stick it on yeah. the end and call it the yeah, end. Yeah, because I film. mean, there's a whole story to be told there about how you know this clearly was what brought an end to the war. But like, how did you get to this point with the refugees and all that stuff and the politics involved in it and dennis quaid's character and all that stuff like it could have been an interesting story as you know what's his face grew up you know being that bridge between both civilizations and stuff as um uh, what's his name with a z i always forget it too uh zombies little kid zombies Zombies, yeah but i mean yeah 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 it just seems to it seems to trip over itself to get to the end by this kind of like dune Right. Like, and I can see where it's being (laughs) compared to that. Cause like Mm. you watch the original Lynch cut of Dune and it's like first hour and a half, 90 minutes flow pretty well. Then once you get to that third act, it's like, we've got to shove 5,000 pages worth of shit into 20 minutes here. Let's get her done. And that's kind of what this feels like here in a way. Yeah. And suddenly rains at the end of the movie. That always cracked me up. Yeah. You oh, you brought them back. Oh, well, then we'll just call off the war at this point. You know, right? Yeah. Tom, who was it you just interviewed over on Midnight's Edge? Because I remember watching uh, it. Which one? We we've had Cabrutus on this week. We had Grums on this week. Uh, oh, Andre's done God. flat out interviews, but it's been a while since we've had a formal one brought out. But yeah. Oh my god, I'm trying to find it. I mean, we've been talking a lot of the comic book stuff this week, so I'm not sure what you mean. Yeah, if I can find it, there was somebody you did there. I'm like going, oh, I would love to interview them. And you guys interviewed him. Oh. I can't yeah, remember who it was. Was it Cabrutus? Or... Don't remember. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, names are I mean, striking me. It's been a while since we've had an actual formal interview. 
Um, I think one of the last ones we re- brought up. Oh, was like, on, it was Graham Hancock. Seven. Months I was gonna ago. say that was a while ago. Yeah, Andre had talked to Graham Hancock. It was like was seven months ago, one. and I'm like, yeah, I've yeah. been trying to reach out to him for a while. That was uh, kind of a weird fluke of an event. Um, Andre would have to be explained a little better than I could, obviously. But from my John understanding, wants to interview him. Well, I mean, you could ask him, but like from my understanding, uh, how it worked out was just Andre had. Can't remember if he did a video that was about the. I think it actually he had brought that that his Netflix series up. In the uh, it was out during the time of the Woman King, I think. If I remember correctly, so this might even be a little farther back than that. But like, so he ended up bringing up that series in in one of his videos, and Graham liked. He had heard like through somebody that knew Graham that Graham liked the his take on it, even though Andre didn't completely agree with everything or something like that. And Andre had said something like that. And he's like, well, that's fine. He's like, he he's used to people not agreeing with him, but he goes, I think he'd like to actually talk to you or something. And it, that just started a correspondence. If I remember correctly, oh, so between the two it was like through an intermediate, but uh, you'd have to ask Andre again. Cause that was way, that's something that happened in the background. He did it very quietly. Um, and it took him a while to get it all put together, but yeah. So, and Andre also had to run it through a lot of channels when it was done too, before we could actually put it up. But, uh, I don't know how much more I can say than that. So, yeah. Yeah. But it's a really good interview. And I, I'm a big fan of his work and uh, smart dude, man. He is a, yeah. Cause normally guy. I was the guy who brought in a bunch of interviews and stuff. I mean, we still sitting on like four or five interviews we haven't released yet, but, and a couple that we had that had technical difficulties that got fucked up, but yeah. Yeah, I was so pissed. Our, the last thing we did with Tracy Torme. Otherwise, we did have uh, Dean Kane on. I almost said that, but then you said Graham Hancock. So you, you, know. you know, Tracy Torme is a writer on Star Trek. He created a lot of stuff for tra- Star Trek. A big UFO guy. And he created Sliders, the show, not the burger. Oh, uh, um, okay. And uh, I was friends with him. And... um we got him to come on, man, but that dude had the worst internet I've ever seen. Worse than mine. Oh, his would, he'd be going, it, um, and we were going, <laughs> and it was just, that's what it was like talking to him. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, is, man. Like, is he doing that like I do, or is he like really having internet issues? Mm. Maybe he's got Tourette's or something. <laughs> but now we'll never get him because he passed away this this last february oh bummer so great dude though i really liked him we we got two two interviews out of him had him on the show even on a panel once but god his internet is garbage and i hate that dude when you've got somebody that you're just excited to talk to and yeah. then they've got shit internet and you're like, oh, this is just not going to fucking work. You ever have that happen, Tom? Yes. Yeah, it's happened. That or they just don't even know how to navigate it. We've had like an interview or two that just didn't. We actually were supposed to talk to Harold Faltemeyer. And uh, really? He's gotten hmm. away. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, the sad part man. is one of the rules were not to ask him about <laughs> Beverly Hills Cow. I- can't ask you about Beverly Aww. Hills. It's like what? It's like that's the only th- what? No, I didn't mean that's the only thing. That is like that's when I went to things, dinner. You know, like what the fuck? I went to have dinner with David Lynch through Ron. Yeah, I remember Judy. you telling me this story. Yeah, and right when we're getting out of the car, Ron turns from the front seat. I'm in the back passenger side, and as I'm opening my door to get out, he turns and looks at me through that little crack, you know, and he goes, "And by the way." You can't bring up Dune. It's <laughs> <laughs> the only reason Damn it. I'm fucking <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, uh. <laughs> well, I was bummed because, yeah, this is just when we had learned that Beverly Hills Cop 4 was happening and all that stuff. And I'm like, what? Well, I got to ask him if he's doing the music for 4 because everybody was disappointed he wasn't. I mean, it's not like I want to say anything negative. It was like, I just want to bring up the fact that everybody, I'm guessing I mean, everybody was disappointed. That he never got he, paid extra money. That, that or they game. didn't bring him back for three, and that's what I wanted to ask him about was what was the deal there, was why he didn't do part three, and I'm assuming he probably wanted more money and they were willing to pay him, and or Eddie Murphy wanted Nile Rodgers to do the music, who Nile Rodgers is it's a very prolific producer. Why they didn't bring, 
mm. Robert Duvall back for Godfather Three. Uh, could very, very well, but see, Eddie also was very much into music, so I could see it be Eddie because Pre- there's a famous story, and I have both versions of the soundtrack of the first film where Eddie pressured them to put on a Rick James song, and the Rick James song was an actual title track, and they didn't use it in the film because it's a shit song, to be honest with you. It's not a very good song. <laughs> You can you can find it on YouTube. It's called BHC, Beverly Hills Cop by Rick James. And it's on the initial release of the soundtrack, but they pulled it. And and they they put one mm. of the songs that was actually in the movie on the soundtrack that wasn't originally because it was just a piss poor song and it was all under Eddie's like just because he was really heavy into heavy duty with uh, Rick James at that point. So I would not be surprised if by the time we get to Beverly yeah, Hills Rick Cop James three, because produced that song my baby parties all the time. Yeah. Party all the time and all that shit. But like, I think that by the time we got to Beverly Hills cop three, Eddie was also producing more music at that point. And I don't know if Niall was one of his producers or what, but for those, he was a huge producer. So, I mean, and again, it's like, I'm not trying to shit on Niall Rogers at all. Cause he's great at what he does, but he's not Harold Faltermeyer. And what mm-hmm. he does is basically a remix of the original, <laughs> It's like if you're gonna do that, why don't you just have Harold come in and do it? It makes absolutely no sense. And I'm trying to think at the time. I don't think Harold was doing anything else at that point. I mean, so he'd done a few movies up to that point, so it's not like he wasn't still working. So I don't know. I don't. It's sort of like I don't know. It's it's really weird. There's this this one guy. I forget his name right now. He did Terminator and Fright Night themes. Oh, Brad uh, Fidel. Yeah, Brad Fidel, and he's just. You just don't see him on anything. Oh, Shinotsky. Thanks yep. for showing up after the show is ending thing. So really, I have no idea what his animosity is towards Beverly Hills Cop and the music and all that shit. So <laughs> you can't even ask to find out. I couldn't really ask to find part. out, but that was my assumption is that he wasn't brought back for part three. And it probably was some really something to do with like that. Cause that's the only reason like, why would you have Niall do Harold's music and just not bring Harold back. It was probably because Eddie insisted because that's the thing. Beverly Hills cop three is one of those movies where I, I enjoy it for how much of a train wreck it is in certain ways, because if you know the behind the scenes on that movie and how it happened, it's oh. hilarious. Cause like basically they had to bow finger Eddie Murphy into being funny in that movie. Cause the studio went through a couple different directors and they finally got John Landis on there. And this is after Eddie and him and had it fa- had their falling out famously Hmm. and eddie's thing was he didn't want to be funny so the studio tells john he's like eddie don't want to be funny so find ways of making him funny without him knowing because he wanted to make beverly hills top three like dead fucking serious right like he wanted serious i remember he wanted his oscar that's where he started his whole thing with that and it's just like eddie what are you doing you ruined it because beverly hills cop three could have been a lot of fun i do like some elements of it and you can tell through the film, John Landis is trying his damnedest to make a good movie. But between the writing and, and Eddie just doing what Eddie's doing, and you've got a couple of the, the one main bad guy who's in a completely different movie. Like, I don't know what movie he showed up for, but uh, yeah. And then you got some veterans in there like John Saxon and stuff that are great. And you got all the John Landis isms with all the cameos, including the famous George Lucas one. But uh yeah, at the end of the day, I think Eddie Murphy was all over that, and he kind of self sabotaged it. Bummer. It's not happened. That's the one that get, takes place at the park, right? Yes. Yep. Well, that was yeah. the whole thing too. Was that uh, initially it was supposed to be Disney World, but then Paramount's well, we've got Six Flags and all that shit, so they shot it out of Six Flags, and I can't remember the other park. Um, but yeah, one of the other, uh, not Bush Gardens, but one of those kind of parks. I can't remember where it was. Well, Six uh, Flags is one we ha- we have here, and uh, 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 the one in Virginia uh, it ha- is called King's Dominion, hmm. and it's owned by the same people that do Six Flags. I also remember what Universal, like some of the ride scenes were Universal ones, like the the earthquake. I was gonna there. say, I think the earthquake one was a repurposed Universal thing and something like that. Yeah, because then they have like the Cylons or whatever the hell they are from. Uh, Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Yeah, they, appear in, uh, yeah. they, they appear in the Get Smart, uh, the nude bomb. The silence of there, the universal ride. Oh, really? Yeah. If, go back oh. and watch that fucking weird movie, man. That is a weird movie. I've been staying away from it, but I think, okay, I'll give it a chance then. 
The best part of Beverly Hills Cop 3, though, was getting Surge back, though, too. That was... Oh, Surge is there. <laughs> the name is Surge. Surge? Surge. When you say Surge, Surge it sounds like a detergent. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the guy that ran the park that was supposed to be like Walt Disney there at the end? Yeah, there was like a thought. Walt Disney kind of character, Morty or whatever the hell's name was or whatever. Yeah, it was played by a famous <laughs> actor Morty from the old days. Yeah, um, shit, I'm trying to remember who it was. I'm man. looking it up right now to see if I can find Oh, Hector Elizondo's in it, too. Yes, he plays the stand-in for uh, um, Taggart. Because uh, the guy who played Taggart, I'm forgetting his name offhand, but he was shooting another movie at that time, so they couldn't get him back. Yeah, because it seemed like I thought for some reason in, in my memory, and I, I and you corrected me before, that I thought he had died in the series, that he'd been killed. No, but, you know. he was supposed to be in part three. And in fact, like I said, I'm sure that's all they did was just repurpose all his lines for Hector. They just changed the bit in the beginning where they say, oh, he's off retired. But uh, I can't remember what movie he was shooting at the time. Some For some reason, I think Ralph Macchio was in it too. <laughs> my cousin uh, Denny? No, it's not that. It was another oh. movie he made around that time, and it was a comedy, but, like, I'm trying to remember what it was. But if you go look up around 93, 94, when he would have shot that, that's what he was making. John Ashton was making at the same time instead. Mm. Um, I just remembered his name, but, yeah. He's like, thanks, but no thanks, and he had a better offer, evidently, probably. Alan Young is the guy. There it is. Yeah. Is the Walt Disney character. Uncle Dave, that was his name in the movie. Uncle Dave. <laughs> With the bow tie and shit. Do the okie dokie yeah. shuffle. See, all that shit yeah. makes me like, like, they did a really good job of, like, building up this, like, you know, fake Disney kind of persona. And, all, like, there's there's bits. We'll get to Beverly Hills Cop 3. We're going to talk about that later this year, I think. We plan on it. So. Yeah, I still have it scheduled. It's pushed yeah, off. Yeah, we still got to talk about part two yet, don't we? Yeah, we still have done part two. I think I'm just going to take down Close Encounters because I don't think we're ever going to get it. We'll to get it. to it. It was just one of those things that I think it was a fluke of time that we were going to, and then it just didn't happen. Come on, man. Know, once we get to October, I, I would like you and I to focus on some of the great like Halloween movies. Yeah, I that'd like, be cool. I love the festive. Period. Well, we don't Halloween have much coming favorite. out for a while here. I think the next big movie is Planet of the Apes, and that's in May. Yeah. So, I mean, we could maybe do, like, the original Planet of the Apes. And I'd love to yeah. talk about that movie. Mm. I already made this a slideshow. Don't you dare. <laughs> oh, we'll do it's Close Encounters. Show. We'll do it. We just got to. Well, maybe it'll fit it's in a week. It's only been delayed for 14 months. That's not well, I was just saying. Now, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying, since we don't have anything <laughs> big coming out for, like, a couple of weeks, maybe we can fit it in the next show or two here, yeah. I was or basically, we can make Martin do all the screenshots from the uh, Planet of the Apes TV series. That'd what I'd bad. rather do is have Martin <laughs> film himself acting out the entire movie. <laughs> ah, there we go. Playing all the characters. Um, I, I am not. I am not Michael Pena. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't need an ape mask on top we, of that. When we do the close the encounters, I think there's. <laughs> we got to find that interview with Spielberg where he basically says that he wouldn't make half that movie Ooh. now. I'm kidding, really, Martin. yeah. He said really? he, it was kind of like along the lines of like things that he would or wouldn't do in the film now because he wasn't a father at that point. Hmm. And he, he, looking back on it now, he's like, Oh, I totally would have done things differently. Like, one, he would have had the mother searching endlessly for the child, right? right. Secondly, he would have had the, 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 the whole Richard Dreyfus character acting and reacting a little bit differently. And he hmm. said he probably wouldn't have had him leave at the end. Interesting. Hmm. Because, because that was something kids. that stuck with a lot of people was like, how could he just leave his kids in why like that? And then Spielberg said at the time, I didn't think of that crap. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have kids and stuff yet, you know. Biblically, if you think about it though, like Peter did that. If you know, and the it's fact true. I mean, men Peter, change after they have kids. kids. Yeah. Um, but Peter left his family, his kids, to follow uh Jesus. In, in in the book and hmm. it's like it, when i always when i found so that out of like, is that what you're saying geary i was just like i didn't like that i didn't like that he did that in the of course spielberg hates the special edition i'm sure everybody knows that even though he makes especially it the special edition of the bible 
<laughs> yeah. Remember the scene where uh, Jesus comes back again? No. <laughs> I was only kidding, guys. <laughs> and, they, and they show and heaven at the end. The he, he hates that version. No, but yeah, that's what I was referring to is the part where they show the ship inside the ship. He hates that, hmm. I guess. Because to him, the movie ends where it ends. Like <laughs> It's like the studio made me do that because they wanted yeah. to re-release it. Everyone attacks with walkie-talkies. That's the ending of the movie. Walkie-talkie fight. <laughs> All right. I've got to say that this is... Uh, this this makes me oh, such a my. bad Catholic that I've always considered this the the what heaven should be like, and uh, it's it's from Monty Python: The Meaning of Life. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah. yeah! You can't show all this. No, I got to stop it there right now before it goes yep. any further. <laughs> you can't show this on television. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That scene just laid me. Well, like I just way. watched Major League the other night. You can't say shit on the radio. Ah, who gives a shit? Nobody's listening anyway. I know. <laughs> I so love you think Bob Yuker, a really that good movie. 4K? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, I looked. I was impressed actually, and and actually, uh, Meaning of Life is a good one too. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I was impressed with how good it was. That was one we should talk about one of these days too. I, I don't know if you're a fan. Absolutely, of I'm a big I, fan of Major League. I. I, yeah, I watched Meaning of Life in the theater when it came out. Now, I, that's the only movie I've ever come close to walking out on. Really? Wow. Yep. yep. Were you I just not was, up to uh, the Monty Python thing, or you just thought it was below them? I thought it was below them. I thought this was a contractual obligation movie, like their album, their final album. I oh. thought they were phoning oh, it in. the contractually and, obligated album. See, yes, I, yes. I like it because, to me, it feels like an actual Monty Python movie. Like, we're actually getting skits, so it's almost like a... Oh, I, I like it better But now, I get what Tom. you're saying, yeah. But, I, but I'll tell you what, I was a huge fan at the time. I had just finished, you know, I'd been watching Python's Flying Circus in, the, in high school. Uh, I was in college, went to see it, and I was just like, this has its moments, but it's only moments. I mean, I laughed all the way through the first two movies, and then I watched The Meaning of Life. It was like I'm not laughing at everything now. I mean, mm. it, it's 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 it is a it is a much more it's a much more difficult movie with the humor's a lot blacker. I mean, the ending is great. I love That's that it. scene it's at the end. It's a very dark ending. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just bleak. But like, there are parts of the film that you go through, and you're like, meh. And then there are parts where you're like, oh, I love this part right here. Oh, oh yeah. Creosol every sperm is, every uh, birth every part sperm two, is your, the third world. Who there. didn't walk yes. around singing that fucking song? Exactly. As, as a I've done it. The universe that. song. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've done that in karaoke. Oh, yeah. 100 billion. <laughs> just like... <laughs> Eric yeah. Idle really not. He's had to fix it like two times now, I guess. But yeah, because yeah. scientists keep writing him about it. Yeah, I, 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 that can't be found. Yeah. Thank you, Shanae. Why I, couldn't I was, you just I lose was, him in an accident? No, I could throw would cease to a rubber <laughs> or uh, on the end of my John Thomas, and we could just go in there. Oh yes, dear. <laughs> yeah, yes. couldn't you just cut your balls off or something? <laughs> Oh, yeah. an accident. oh no children god would see through such a charade <laughs> Get that, I mean, would my, you favorite dear? Moment, my favorite moment oh, in the man. Film, there are two two moments that just stick in my head uh number one is is death and it's like yes. excuse me but how did we all die and then it points at the salmon moose. But I didn't have the oh, salmon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't yes. know. I didn't have the salmon yeah. moose. Um, the irony of that scene. And then, of course, you know, the next one is the cleaning woman, you know, explaining to me, you know, oh, when all is said and done, at least I can say I never worked for Jews. Yeah, I like I, 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 I like Graham Chapman having chosen his his manner of execution to be oh. chased by a bunch of barebreak <laughs> roller derby girls <laughs> yes, for yes. the crime of having made a sexist <laughs> joke. Yep, <laughs> yep. that's they so ahead of their they, time on that one. They yeah. were, oh God. and they were ahead of their time in Life of Brian too. Yes. As well with the I want to be called Loretta. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't have a wound. You, you do realize wound. you do realize that that could get them arrested in Scotland right now. 
<laughs> oh god, yeah, yeah. Exactly. They're trying to get that removed. Yeah, just from the show that show. movie up there or oh, say they're going have to have babies. Up. Anybody that shows up gets arrested. Yeah, that's right. Oh, oh, damn right. babies. <laughs> it's symbolic of his struggle to have babies. Okay. It's symbolic okay. of his struggle against reality. <laughs> <laughs> we accept that oh, you would man. like to have baby <laughs> uh, and that brings us back to this movie and that movie uh, just defined woke is... in and of itself in a nutshell that whole scene yeah. right there yes <laughs> yes it did uh, 30 I years ago the Romans have it done for us hungry. really <laughs> that scene in the Coliseum where he went well they didn't give us the aqueduct yeah. well yes they didn't give us the aqueduct yes, yes. yep yeah. I, well, besides the aqueducts, what did they really give us? Roads. Wow, well, oh, they gave yes, us education. <laughs> education, yes, yes. Public order. Uh, I think the line that best si uh, signs up uh, lines up with the modern zeitgeist is "Help, help! I'm being repressed." <laughs> yes. Well, besides Dennis the, the roads and the aqueduct well, and, and, and the education and <laughs> what are the roads? What have the really Romans done? ever done for us? <laughs> Uh, who Roll didn't peace? laugh at that scene where he's writing graffiti on the wall and the yes. Roman guard is correcting his grammar? And... <laughs> oh, <laughs> which yeah. is which, by the way, which by the way, from from what I've read, is is straight out of an English public school. That is mm -hmm. like boarding school in England. That is how the that is how a, a, a professor would correct you when you screwed up your Latin lines. And then you'd have to write it out a hundred times. Well, you can tell because it's in the wall as well. That's why I always yeah. felt like the wall was like some weird, twisted, dark Monty Python skin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Pink Floyd, the wall. Oh, yeah. 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 You got to you kind of your pudding and all that shit. Like, yeah. Yep. And, then the, and then the senator, biggest, thickest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that, there's a trivia one for you. When they I sent the. Stickering. When, when they sent the extras into that scene as the yeah. centurions, they didn't yeah. tell them anything about it. They only told them, don't laugh. Don't laugh. Yep. And then all the dialogue happens around them, and they're all turning purple, trying not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good scene. And then the male inserts the, the penis inside the vagina. Oh, my God, that scene. Yeah. I'm yes. doing this for you, scene. for your education, not for my benefits. So pay attention. <laughs> yes. Look closely. I'm not doing it twice. Yeah. <laughs> then I love the small talk they're making. Yes. <laughs> and then the rugby scene uh. at the end where the kids have to go up against the masters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they get wiped out. <laughs> Uh, what, I think uh, the reason most people dislike that movie is the restaurant scene and the baby yep. scene. Those are the two, which that is my favorite scene. Key in on, yeah, the restaurant mm. scene. I, I that is the one that's grown on me the most. That really is. Yeah, uh, like I, I hated it at first, and I and I think it's hysterical now. But don't try to explain it to anybody because they well, they, they will not get it. It's it's almost like he knows he's a a, a ticking bomb. And he says, yeah. would you care for an after-dinner mint? Yeah. Just yeah. a Love wafer, wafer in mint. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I ate a lot right now. He's like, fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. For that. Fuck, fuck off, off, he says. Fuck, fuck, fuck off. Well, it's only wafer thin, sir. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> and then he puts it on there, puts his tongue back <laughs> in his mouth, and he goes, but Appetite. Yeah, and then yes. run. <laughs> and then leaps over the potted plants to get out of the line of fire. I love that scene. Oh my god. And just <laughs> everything everywhere. And by the way, if you do alive. pay attention to it, because oh, if, if you weren't aware, uh, there's been a little tiff between the Monty Python survivors, uh, mm. between Eric Idle and really John Cleese and the rest. Yeah. Uh, but there was a separation between them that you could tell who was writing what. Mm. If it was music, oh, yeah. it was Eric Idle, you know. Yeah. But John Cleese and Graham Chapman were the two who wrote the most and best known skits, and mm. they would work with um, uh, what's his name closely. Eric um, Idle. No, oh, the the um, guy that, Terry uh, Terry Jones. In, Michael Palin. Uh, my uh, no. Um, yeah, Michael Palin. Michael yeah. Palin. Michael Palin got along with Cleese and Chapman. Yep. 
Whereas yes. the others kind of separated themselves. Well, Joan, you Terry Jones, Terry Jones and, and John Cleese butted heads constantly uh, during yep. the, the TV series. And, you know, Graham was a huge alcoholic in the 70s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can see it in like you can see it in the Holy Grail. I mean, and in some of the episodes, he's he's literally got DTs. He's mm. twitching. Um, so Cleese really wrote most of the stuff they did together, and they they did the verbal humor, like the cheese shop sketch and the dead yeah. parrot. Yeah, because he and Graham were like best friends. In yes, real life. and Terry Jones and Michael Palin wrote a lot of the physical comedy, like the fish slapping dance and the Ministry of Silly Walks, and it it absolutely and irritated the lumberjack song yeah yeah but but it used to piss john cleese off no end for years that the first thing that a fan would say to him when, on on recognizing him from monty python is do the silly walk because he didn't write that sketch they cast him because he was so good at it mm. but that was a palin jones sketch and it, it just irritated the hell out of Cleese that nobody asked him to do the part, his part in any of his sketches. <laughs> they, they, they wanted to see the silly walk. So yeah, oh he's, 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 I, I got to apologize guys. We're clearly Monty Python fans. So we <laughs> left the enemy <laughs> mind and just How went into, yeah, talk about a segue. But I, don't tell. I, don't, I don't see any enemy. I feel this movie is really uh, a lie. <laughs> So I do want to say Enemy Mind uh, is a great film. Hmm. It's not perfect. It's got a lot of problems, but it is a worthwhile film to watch. Louis Gossett Jr.'s performance alone is worth the price of admission on this yes. film. Yeah, totally. And um, I think the baby scene is really what leads us to Monty Python. <laughs> yeah. yeah Pretty much. Because when a baby is born, look, you have the machine that goes bing. <laughs> that's the most expensive machine in the entire building that's them making fun of the national health system of the uk yeah. yes well yeah it's the, almost the, indicative of all now yeah this is the the move that this is one movie where the actors deserved a better run production the script for the most part was there well done the effects were okay i wouldn't say they were great by even by 85 standards uh, mm -hmm. There was a bit of a Star Trek, you know, cardboard boulder vibe at times, but the performances are amazing, and I agree with you. It's at the end. I don't think it's just uh, Louis Gossett Jr. Uh, those two guys pretty much carry this film between them, and yeah. they both they both have to, and they do. This is you know, so Dennis Quaid deserves some credit there as well, mm. but the the production issues, the budget issues. Basically, as we talked about for the, the third act, where it just seems like they started picking stuff up off, you know, picking film up and splicing it together and saying, where, when do we get something that we can say is the end of the film um, is, what's, is what this film suffers from. Um, so I can understand why the critics hated it, because they would have looked at it from a movie making point of view and a storytelling point of view and, and said, well, it's terrible. You know the the performances can't save it. It's still a it's still a bad production, um, and it, I feel sorry for the actors in it because they did such a hell of a job with what they were given, and uh, the movie still worth. I agree, the movie is still worth watching. Yeah, you know if you pay attention, yes, you will have some. Uh, wait a minute, how did we get here? Moments in the film. Um, but for the most part, if they had, yeah, I think if they'd added about 15 more minutes of very carefully inserted explanation that would lead you to from here, from A to B in, or A to F, which is what right. they did in the movie and give you a little bit of a path there, it would have worked better. Um, but they were so over budget by the time they got to, you know, their, the final stages of production that I think the studio was about ready to pull the plug would have, would have pulled the plug if they hadn't given quaid and gossip uh such lucrative contracts they didn't want to just throw that money away hmm. so they finished it but i i think it suffers for the production and not the actors i would actually like to get a copy of the shooting script and i've yet to find a copy anywhere of it because i would like to see what they were supposed to make 
Very, very curious. Uh, and of course, the screenplay was uh, by uh, what is that guy's name? Um, Edward Kambara. And he had done Lady Hawk. He also uh, wrote Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. And he worked on the, the 1998 Merlin TV series. A few other stuff. He's still alive. I wonder. Uh, Wolfgang Peterson's still alive. We should definitely try to hunt him down. Gary, I'd love to interview you, him. Gary, Gary, Gary there's, there's a link in the private chat that I think you should share on the on screen. Yeah, I was going to show you that earlier, but time got away from me, so you might like this. Oh, my. Yes. That's his arms and the teeth, and it's the rest of the props. Yes. So, yeah, let me share it real quick, and then we can end this show because we, we've gone a little long. Mm. Yep. We, we get I, all ADD and, and start fucking just going I off. do do my hunting. There we go. As you asked. Uh, oh, I went to add it and somebody else did. Yeah. So that's the sleeve and gloves that uh, he wore. Yep. The teeth. It looks like upper, lower, and the lenses. Damn. Yeah, it's only like in the pieces of the of the headpiece. Yeah, and it's already been sold. Um, it's been purchased. And the claws. Look at those in the mold of his mouth. Yep. That's yeah, I bad. guess we uh -huh. can. Kind of end this by saying, yeah, as far as Lewis Gossett goes, this is probably one of his more spectacular performances. I don't know if it's his best performance, but definitely, you know, he put the most into memorable. it character wise. It's one right? of his most yeah. memorable roles. I'll say, yeah, that. and in a sense that, like, I mean, I'm sure he's had more dramatic performances. I know you guys just talked about Officer and the Gentleman and such like that. Um, but that's the thing about this performance and other ones. And that's the thing that the thing that I was saying about um lewis last week even though some people kind of got uppity about it or said well that's kind of a racist thing to say but i'm like is it though i'm like at the Not time really. he when he uh uh was in his prime like in this era he was one of the few black actors that just wasn't playing black characters hmm. and what i mean by that like he was playing like the officer in a gentleman role he was playing this role he was playing the type of roles that weren't always you know delegated just because of his skin color now sure he did a few movies that had to do with some race but i mean i mean he was in movies like iron eagle and other things even though he's playing mm -hmm. somebody based on a true person it doesn't change the fact that he was still in these movies all the time and he wasn't there playing you know the token role uh mm -hmm. at that yeah, time and you period. know that and there wasn't a lot of actors like him and, and I, I even compared him to like Sidney poitier and a couple others morgan freeman being good examples of actors who definitely rose above their color as far as status in hollywood and, and didn't use that as a crutch and didn't uh, denzel washington a few of those race guys exactly of it. yeah yeah which is something that taylor hackford himself did kind of do but for a good reason which is he went to the actual training center when he was before making the film yeah, i heard and about he that. discovered that the marine drill instructors that were training these uh, future officers, flight officers, a uh, majority of them were black. And that's when he changed it. Cause uh, there was a misnomer that was spread by the media at the time is that uh, the character was supposed to be white, but he, you know, Lewis Gossett Jr. was so good. He knocked it out of the park. And that wasn't what happened. Taylor Hackford said that he changed his mind. And started looking. You do know that we've talked to Taylor Hackford before. Yes, right? I do. That's why I brought. Okay, it up. I was going to say that was just a fluke of luck on Robert Meyer Burnett's part. But yeah, he's a he was a. I would love to have dived dove into his other work. Like I mean, it was against the lots really is my, one of my favorite films of all time. I mean, he has a, a a a body of work that's amazing. Not just what he's directed, but even produced and stuff too. Keep in mind, but yeah, like I mean. Taylor Blood Hackford. in, Blood Out, Ray, Devil's Advocate, Dolores Claiborne, La Bamba, mm. Against All Odds. I mean, he's so had many films to do with that are on my top 20. Yeah. List. 
And I love his choices. Against All Odds, again, is one of my favorite films he ever did. Uh, I love that movie. It's a remake of um, Out of the Past, Robert Mitchum and Kirk Douglas. And I feel Lucky that... Lucky Bastard is married to Helen Mirren. I oh, mean, my God. Could you oh, imagine yeah. that? God. But uh, sorry, baby. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I, I just, I don't know. Taylor Hackford is a great director. I really like his, his, his body of work. It really is good stuff. But with this film, again, people thought that he was looking for a, a white guy and found a black guy. It's not what happened. He had changed it, the casting of it, because of what he, when he met all those Marine drill instructors that were training these officers, uh, officer candidates. And uh, another thing he pointed out was that Louis Gossett Jr. played the very first black man in a film that was in charge of white guys. Yeah, Ever. that's what I'm saying. And like somebody kind of mm. scuffed when I compared him to like Sydney and stuff. I'm like, no, no, you really got to think about it a little bit. He does not get the kind of uh, attention that those guys got, but the he respect. did get those kind of roles. Yeah, right? people even forget yeah. that he played the guy who ran uh, SeaWorld in, in Jaws 3. 3, right, 3D. For yeah, fuck's sake. Uh, 3D, I mean, like, yeah. how often would you yeah. expect a black man to be in that role? I, like, never. Exactly. Like, it's just, Duke, man. They're both. Underrated. He didn't get the role because he was black. He got the role because he was Lewis Gossett Jr. That's why he got the yeah. fucking role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Lewis motherfucking Gossett Jr. Gossett Jr. Exactly. <laughs> That's how I'm big credit. Lewis motherfucking. He's, got a, and he's great in that movie. I don't give a shit what anybody says about Jaws yeah. 3. Oh, I like that movie. I like Jaws 3. He was like uh, the Samuel yeah. L. Jackson before Samuel he L. Jackson. Was. He totally he was. was. Yes. Exactly. That's right. he was. Yes. exactly. Deep That's deep why deep. he was so awesome. Yep. And uh, yeah, and who did I'm not gonna close fucking... it down and seal the box? Yeah, me seal who the box. Yeah. <laughs> who didn't freak out when uh, Sam Jackson got eight? Oh yeah, I remember Deep Blue Sea or whatever. I yeah. jumped back. Well, that's funny you mentioned that because, like, in, in that movie, I feel like Sam L. Jackson is fucking channeling Lewis Gossett Jr. for <laughs> yes. Jaws Three. Pretty much. It's like he's playing Pretty his much. son or some shit. We are like, gonna weird. work together. We and then he fucking yeah. dies. Gary, I think it's time for a message from Brian. Yeah, we gotta get rolling here. Yeah, I'm I'm mm. uh I'm tuckered out and hungry. I haven't eaten anything today. Let's see, brand uh that German oh, wait, I did it. I did at breakfast. I apologize. Yeah. But yeah, I Louis lied. Gossett Jr. will be missed. He was a, a hell of an actor, hell of an actor. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. Met him briefly so, in Calgary Comic Con. Awesome guy. Yeah. Just the nicest guy ever. You know what Brian thinks of that? That's it. Show's over. All right, guys. We're out of here. Everybody have a good Saturday. Read the book. Read the book. Yeah. Uh, the link was made available to you guys, um, and uh, it's on Amazon. And you can definitely, it's two two forty nine, dollars I think it was. And it's based, it's the novella. It's a small book. That's why it's so cheap. Mm -hmm. The Kindle edition. So have a great weekend, guys. Thanks again, Tom. Thanks again, Anima. Thanks again, Red Shirt. Thanks again, Martin. Thanks again for uh, Mikey showing up there, Comic Relief Crusader. And, you know, um, fuck you, Shinotsky. Thanks for showing up. Bye, guys. See ya. <laughs>